Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Safer Consumer Products Workshop on Chemicals in Hair Straightening Products. My name is Michelle banks Ardone, and I am a Public Participation Specialist with the Department of Toxic Substances Control, which we will be referring to as DTSC. We are part of the California Environmental Protection Agency. I will be facilitating this workshop and encouraging you to provide us with feedback. Next slide, please. By participating in this workshop, you understand that you have all entered in listening mode with cameras and microphones turned off. You will have the opp opportunity to actively participate during questions and comments. This meeting is also being recorded and will be posted to our website. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, please note that it will be available for download on our website. For those of you joining us by telephone, our website is www.dtsc.ca.gov slash SCP slash safer dash consumer dash products dash workshops dash events. The link to our website will also be provided in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen or the chat. Next slide, please. Our goal for today's workshop is to hear from you. We are seeking information on the use of potentially hazardous chemicals in hair straightening products, their function and prevalence in products, and safer alternatives under development or already in use. Additionally, we want to facilitate dialogue among experts in industry, academia, non-governmental organizations, and other governmental agencies. Next slide, please. You have a couple of ways to actively participate in today's workshop, with comments or by asking clarifying questions. If you are joining us as a web attendee online, please refer to your Zoom toolbar. If you wish to comment verbally, use the raised hand feature to be recognized. When your name is called, please unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation, then begin your question and or comment. To have your question read, simply type it in the Q&A feature. If you are joining us by telephone and wish to comment verbally, please press star nine to join the queue to be recognized. The last digits of your phone number will be called when it's your turn. When your name is called, please press star six to unmute your line. State your name and affiliation, then begin your question or comment. To submit written comments today, please email us if you are on the telephone and have access to email saferconsumerproducts at dtsc.ca.gov. If you're also joining us online and wish to submit written comments, you can submit there as well. As a reminder to everyone engaging with us, we ask that you speak slowly and clearly so that we can accurately record your comments. Next slide. Today's agenda will include a welcome from our director, Dr. Meredith Williams, DTSC presentations, uh, safer consumer products, uh, program overview, as well as social context of hair, background on hair straightening products, and also a summary of chemicals and hair straightening research. After that, we will take a short break and we will begin with our guest presenters today, Overexposed and Underprotected is the title of one of the presentations, followed by Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and Hair Products Used by Black Women, Occupational Chemical Exposure Among Hairdressers of Color, that's a pilot study, and Use of Hair Straighteners in Relation to Breast and Ovarian Cancer Risk, and the Cost of Beauty, Attitudes, Beliefs, and Hair Product Toxicity. We will wrap up and also have closing remarks. Next slide. Now I'd like to introduce the Department of Toxic Substances Control's Director, Dr. Mer Dr. Meredith Williams to bring today's welcome and share a few words. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Michelle. And welcome everyone to this workshop. I appreciate the chance that the program, they, when they asked me to give some opening comments, I really welcomed that chance. Um, 
I think there are some universal truths about women and beauty, which it's, it always seems as though no matter what type of hair women have, they want something different. In the case of African-American women, that becomes very, very complicated and other women of color too. I am one of four sisters and between the four of us, we have been through it all in terms of hair straightening with hot irons and relaxers and perms and ending up with the full spectrum of natural hair and dreadlocks. And each of us had to make very personal choices to decide what was going to work for us. And fortunately, we were in job situations where we had the, the luxury of making that choice. That said, not everyone does. Some would say that actually, the um, when we first started talking about doing this product a number of years ago, there were women in the department who said, please don't touch my hair straightening products. So there are lots of third rails in po politics and perhaps this is one of those third rails because it is so personal. Um, the choices people make about their appearance. And what we know now is that black women aren't just making this choice for aesthetic reasons. In some cases, they're making it for economic reasons, for job security reasons. There is active discrimination against women of color for their hair care choices and their, the decisions they make about how they want to present themselves. We've heard case after case of women being fired from jobs or being told to tame their hair or just flat out being discriminated against because of their hair. In fact, there's an act that you'll hear about a little later today, I believe, called the Crown Act, which really is designed to address this act of discrimination against hair care choices. So obviously there are economic reasons and um, economic security reasons that people are making hair choices. But people should be given the opportunity to make those choices and they shouldn't have to do so with thought to their personal safety and health. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Sometimes women who make the choice that they want to use straightening products are exposing themselves to hazardous chemicals and perhaps um, introducing a potential for harm that they're not even aware of. So as personal as this choice is, we shouldn't be asking people to je then jeopardize their own well-being. So this is a, a very complicated issue to explore. And today and tomorrow, there'll be ample opportunity to look at it from the social, social context, from the toxicological context, from the manufacturing context and really help us bring all of those pieces together so that the Safer Consumer Products Program can make appropriate decisions about how to protect people from the potential harm from these products and how to do so in a way that gives them the freedom to make the choices that they wanna make about how they wanna present themselves and appear and to do so safely. So although I made light of the topic in terms of um, the choices that we make and, um, you know, having having gone on, a, all of us gone on a, a journey to decide what we want to do with our hair, I will say that it is it is very personal and it's very serious. Um, and so I'm so heartened to see the program take on this issue, really think about um, this, not just as a product, but a product in a larger social context and explore these, this issue and determine ways to make these products safer for, um, for the people who choose to use them. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Now we will have our first presentation, providing a program overview of the Safer Consumer Products Program. It will be delivered by Christine Papagni. Mm. She's a senior environmental scientist with the Department of Toxic Substances Control and also the project manager for the Hair Straightening Products team. Christine. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Meredith, for opening up this workshop. Um, we appreciate everyone joining us today online, and we're not only going to be sharing some of our own preliminary findings on chemicals and hair straightening products, but we look forward to hearing from all of you as well. We realize many of you are the experts, and we're just learning. 
Um, but we're hoping this, you know, today's workshop is just part of the conversation on this topic. And to start off, I know some of you are already very familiar with the Safer Consumer Products Program, but we're aware that there are others who are, are just learning about it. So I'm going to provide a high level overview of our program. Next slide, please. Uh, the Safer Consumer Products Regulations took effect in 2013, and they're the framework that, for the Safer Consumer Products Program. And the goal of our program is essentially to implement the Green Chemistry Law, which was enacted in 2008 as part of the Green Chemistry Initiative in California. And the mandates of this law uh, are outlined in the California Health and Safety Code, as shown on this slide. Next slide, please. So the framework we follow is essentially a four phase process and I'm going to go through each of these steps in detail. Um, but as illustrated here, we start with a candidate chemicals list and then we identify and prioritize priority products. And for those who aren't aware, a priority product is essentially a term that we use in our regs um, and it's a product containing candidate chemicals that are of concern. And the fourth stage of this process includes um, manufacturers or other respons responsible entities conducting an alternatives analysis um, to evaluate for safer chemical alternatives. And then the fourth stage is DTSC uh, may issue uh, what we call is a regulatory response and there's a wide range of possible actions. So I'll now go through each of these in more detail. Next slide, please. So our candidate chemicals list is essentially our menu of chemical options. And it's essentially what we call a list of lists. The candidate chemicals on that list of our chemicals that have already been evaluated by other authoritative organizations. And it's based on 23 different authoritative lists. Uh, 15 are based on what's called hazard traits or human health impacts. And eight are based on exposure potential lists. And there are certain exclusions for chemicals on this list, including pesticides as identified by the California Food and Agricultural Code or the federal uh, insecticide, fungicide, and rodenticide act. And other uh, compounds that are exempted include prescription drugs, radioactive chemicals, and natural toxins. Next slide, please. As uh, our candidate chemical list is our menu of chemical options, our three-year priority product work plan is our menu of product options. And every three years we issue a priority product work plan, which includes several product categories of which we may or may not evaluate over a three-year period. Um, and in this three-year work plan, there are some product exclusions, which include medical devices, uh, dental restorative materials, and food. Next slide, please. Our current work plan, our 2021-2023 work plan includes six product categories of which hair straightening products fall under the category of beauty, personal care and hygiene products. Next slide. And uh, our work plan also provides some focus. There are some special considerations that we take into account when we evaluate a product category. Um, and with hair straightening products, these fall within three of these special considerations in that hair straightening products may adversely impact the health of children and workers. And chemicals in hair straightening products are often found uh, in indoor environments, especially in salons. And hair straightening products may also disproportionately impact environmental justice communities. Next slide, please. And so the next phase is step two, our priority product uh, identification and selection. And every time we uh, evaluate priority products, we think of these two key priority principles. There should be exposure to a candidate chemical in the product we're looking at, and that exposure uh, may contribute to or cause significant or widespread adverse impacts. Next slide. So while we're evaluating chemicals, uh, we do so within the context of a product, meaning that we don't evaluate chemicals and products separately. We always evaluate them together. And in doing so, we consider factors uh, such as the concentration of a chemical in a product, whether or not a chemical is contained within the product or easily volatilizes out, and whether that specific chemical and that specific product can contribute to or cause 
adverse impacts to human health or the environment. And in doing this, uh, DTSC uses what we call a narrative approach versus a prescriptive approach when evaluating chemicals and products. And this essentially enables us to use our own and other scientific expertise and research, um, including literature research, feedback from stakeholders such as you who are attending today, um, our own professional judgment when we propose priority products, and our reports and background documents uh, provide the data, information, and scientific basis of all of our decision-making um, when we prioritize chemicals and products. And we, in doing this, we do not use a numerical weighting or ranking system. And this is done intentionally so we can use a precautionary approach rather than be um, limited to a very uh, prescriptive approach. Slide 16, please. So the third phase is the alternatives analysis process, um, which is a process that puts the um, burden on manufacturers or other responsible entities to evaluate their products for safer alternatives to uh, avoid regrettable substitutions. Um, and when conducting an alternatives analysis, we always ask manufacturers um, or those conducting the AA to ask themselves whether a chemical is necessary and are there safer chemical alternatives or other alternatives they could use to make their product safer. And there's a number of requirements for an alternatives analysis. And in addition to evaluating public health impacts, um, they're also required to take into consideration other factors such as ecological impacts impacts of the product all along its life cycle. Um, they're required to conduct a performance evaluation, including whether an alternative is functionally equivalent or feasible. And they're required to conduct an alternate, an economic analysis as well. Um, and all, all alternatives analysis or AAs as we often call them are shared on DTSC's website and made publicly available and are open to public comment. Slide. Next slide, please. So the fourth stage of our process is uh, DTSC issuing what's called a regulatory response. And each of these responses are customized based on the alternatives analysis that are reviewed and the companies that submit them. And while issuing, uh, while a regulatory response may include a sales restriction or prohibition, uh, regulatory responses are not necessarily a product ban or chemical ban. That's not the intention. Other options could include responsible entities providing additional information on their product to the department or providing additional safety measures, um, such as recommending or requiring personal protective gear when consumers use a product. Or another option could be that we require a responsible entity to conduct additional research on safer alternatives. And when issuing a responsible, uh, a regulatory response, I apologize, um, we always try to aim to use the, choose the regulatory response that provides the most protection of human health or the environment and maximizes the use of safer, feasible alternatives. Next slide, please. And so right now uh, we're basically in Phase two of this process, we're evaluating chemicals and products, and we will soon choose some um, which ones we may prioritize. Um, in terms of prioritizing uh, and evaluating the products, uh, we're currently just finished some preliminary research, and we're seeking input from all of you. And we're doing so through this public workshop, as well as holding additional stakeholder meetings and we're also holding a written comment period currently, and we're asking for people to submit written comments or feedback or data through our CalSafer portal uh, through July 9th. And then our next step is to decide which chemicals and products we may uh, propose prioritizing. And we'll then do some more in-depth research and our findings will be summarized in our technical documents, which are called uh, product profiles. And our, those Profiles would then be shared publicly on our website. We'll announce which chemical and product combinations we propose prioritizing. We would provide another opportunity for stakeholder feedback by providing, by holding another workshop and also providing an opportunity for folks to provide written comments. 
And this process can take up to a year. And then following um, prior, proposing a priority product, we then the final stage is to add it to our priority product list through rulemaking. And for those who aren't aware, rulemaking is a basically a formal process that government agencies typically use to make new regulations or amend regulations. And this includes drafting uh, several documents which support the rulemaking in addition to the regulation text itself. And then we would hold a public, after noticing the regulation, we would hold a public hearing and then receive and respond to written comments. And this process can also take up to a year or more. And we do realize this is a time consuming process, but we want all of our research and decision making to be thorough, accurate, and scientifically sound. And as I already said, we're currently soliciting feedback from stakeholders, not just today, but through our CalSAFER portal through uh, July 9th. And we shared our background document, which includes our preliminary findings, as well as has some questions for stakeholders at the back of the document. And we ask that you read that and hopefully uh, provide some comments on that to us. And I also wanted to know, let you know, you know, this is meant to be a conversation between many different um, parties. And we did actually try several avenues to reach out to industry folks uh, to participate at this workshop, either as speakers or as panelists. And we just were unable to find anyone available, but um, we do know that some are participating today online. And we do uh, hope that you provide us some feedback, not just today, but through our CalSAFER portal or by scheduling some meetings with DTSC staff or management. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, we skipped one. All right, I already covered that. So next slide, please, 20. At this time, we will take some clarifying questions. So this is just a reminder, everyone, uh, you have a couple of ways to actively participate. So if you have a question, please, for Christine, uh, raise your hand in the reactions toolbar there at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us online. If you're joining us by telephone, again, you too can be added to the prompt. Just simply press star nine and you will be added to the queue. And next slide, please. So people can see, there we go. Thank you. Would anybody like to ask any clarifying questions about DTSC's process for the Safer Consumer Products Program? We do have one question uh, that has come in via the Q&A, and it is from Jennifer Ortega. Can you restate what you said about the legislation? Um, in terms of the first, that would probably be the first slide, which um, our regulations were enacted in 2013 based off of the green chemistry law, which took effect in 2008. And I'm not sure if you wanted more details than that, Jennifer. If so, Jennifer, please feel free. You can also type it again in the Q&A. Okay, great. Do we have any other clarifying questions for Christine at this time? And if not, we'll have several other opportunities throughout the day for clarifying questions as well as comment. And we're gonna go ahead and proceed with the next slide, Christine. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, so next up we have uh, three presentations which are going to summarize DTSC's uh, screening research and our preliminary findings. We have Michelle banks Ardone, who's going to be talking to us about the social context of hair, followed by Michelle Romero Fishback, who's gonna give a little bit of background on hair straightening products and why we're looking at them. And then we'll have Lynn Nakayama Wong, who's going to provide a summary of the research on chemicals in hair straightening products. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Christine. Next slide, please. 
As Christine indicated, I will be presenting uh, very briefly on the social context of hair. Next slide. Throughout history, hair has played a significant role in society. It is associated with beauty, devotion, youthfulness, and masculinity, uh, which is illustrated in the pictures to your right of the Egyptian, Roman, Greek, Chinese, and Mayan civilizations. Hair is often used to communicate messages about health, wealth, and status. It is viewed as a reflection of our identity because it is both personal and public. Hair relates to our visual culture, something that refers to the tangible or visible, the expressions of a people, a state, uh, or a civilization, and collectively, it describes the characteristics of a body as a whole. Next slide. Hair has always been an important part of adornment in African cultures. In early African civilizations, hairstyles could indicate a person's family background, tribe, and social status. Headdresses and wigs are also worn to symbolize rank and were essential to royal and wealthy Egyptians. Headdresses and hairstyles indicated status and identities across Africa. The photo on the top right depicts hairstyles from Cameroon and Rwanda at the top left and Southern Africa bottom left. When men from the Wolof tribe in modern Senegal and Gambia went to war, they wore a braided style shown on the bottom right. Many believe that given its close location to the skies, hair was a conduit for spiritual interaction with God. Next slide. It is estimated that 11,640,000 Africans were kidnapped from the African continent and imported as goods to foreign lands in the Western hemisphere between the 16th and 20th centuries due to the transatlantic slave trade. Many slaves were forced by slave owners to shave their hair so they would be more, quote unquote, sanitary. The intent was to strip Africans of their culture and heritage. These acts of shaving their hair alienated Africans from anything that resembled their identity. Next slide. Now, not all slaves would shave their head. Many would just braid their hairs tightly in corn rolls, which were allowed because they were considered, quote unquote, neat and clean. Corn rolls were efficient and life-saving as they provided the African slave population with elaborate maps so they could escape from plantations. Colombian slaves uh, devised ways to escape slavery using corn rolls. San Basilio de Palinque, a village in northern Colombia around the 17th century was a refuge for slaves who escaped in this manner. Corn rolls represent pride and heritage in people of African descent. Next slide. During the 19th century, slavery was abolished in much of the world, including the United States in 1865. However, many people of African descent felt pressure to fit in with the dominant culture and society and adjusted their hair accordingly. The end of the 19th century also saw the invention of the hair straightening comb, which would be used to tame black hair. Madam C.J. Walker, an inventor and entrepreneur of African descent, popularized the comb, and by the mid-1920s, straight hair had become the preferred texture to signal middle-class status. The industry grew to the extent that Madam C.J. Walker, who sold hair growth products, shampoos, and ointments, is recorded as the first African-American self-made millionaire in the United States. Next slide. The Afro hairstyle emerged in the United States during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. It was a symbol of rebellion, pride, and empowerment. It was an assertion of black identity in contrast to previous trends inspired by mainstream fashions. However, straight hair along with lighter skin became the beauty ideal. From ages as young as four years old, uh, girls began the process of chemically straightening their hair. The longer, the straighter, the better. Uh, and this was perpetuated by mainstream media. Next slide. Rigid appearance standards regulating the appearance of people of African descent in the United States have been in place since their import to the Americas. 
The Tenyon laws were passed in cities like New Orleans, where free Creole women of color wore these elaborate hairstyles that displayed their coils uh, with an air of regality. The Tenyon laws were passed in 1786 by Governor Esteban Rodriguez Miro and prohibited Creole women of color from displaying excessive attention to dress and appearance. One stipulation was that they must wear a tenyan or a scarf to cover their hair to signify that they were members of a slave class, regardless of whether they were free or enslaved. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended segregation in public places, banned employment discrimination, and created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. However, it did not foresee that hair would need equal access as well. There have been multiple cases where individuals of African descent have been discriminated against or denied employment unless they change their hair. The court cases that follow, Jenkins versus Blue Cross Mutual Hospital Insurance, Rogers versus American Airlines, Tatum, Perot, and uh, Boone versus Hyatt Regency, and the Equal Opportun Employment Opportunity Commission on behalf of Chastity Jones versus Catastrophe Management Solutions are all examples of hair discrimination. Next slide. This slide illustrates common hairstyle trends for people of African descent in the United States from 1970 to now. Hairstyle trends have continued to change over the last few decades, and it comes down to texture and personal preference. This decade is currently seeing a rise in natural hairstyles, but relaxers and straighteners are still being used. Next slide. The Crown Act, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, um, the official campaign, which was led by the Crown Coalition, was created in 2019 by Dove and members, the National Urban League, Color of Change, the Western Law Center on Poverty. And they did so to ensure protection against discrimination based on race-based hairstyles by extending statutory protections to hair texture and protective styles such as braids, locks, twists, and knots in the workplace and public schools. According to their research, one and a half, black women were one and a half times more likely to be sent home from the workplace because of their hair. And 80% of black women were more likely than white women to agree with the following statement. I have to change my hair from its natural state to fit in at the workplace. Now, no matter how people of African descent choose to wear their hair, it should not pose a health threat. On September the 30th, 2020, the Cosmetic Safety Act, also known as Assembly Bill 2762, was signed into California law. Beginning in January 2025, this law will prohibit the use of several chemical ingredients in cosmetic products, including hair straightening products. Next slide. We had a few challenges when we prepared our background documents, which are available online. I hope you've had an opportunity to review those. And if not, you will do so following this meeting. Um, the reason for that was that other research documents with which we looked um, had inconsistent use of terms in resource materials relating to our study populations. To ensure consistency as well as inclusivity in our research analysis and initial findings, we use the following terminology when describing ethnic groups based on their place of ancestral origin. Again, so if you look in our documents, you will note that when we talk about our populations, it is based upon ancestral origin. Now we came to this decision um, as a result of researching dated and preferred ethnic terminology. We consulted with our colleagues in the Office of Environmental Equity, uh, also inquired with a number of academics, and we looked at identifying terminology utilized by other prevalent and acceptable agencies, such as the U.S. Census Bureau and the United States Department of Education. 
We concluded that the place of ancestral origin was the best method of describing ethnic groups for the purpose of our documents. For more details, you can also reference the background document. We acknowledge that no one is monolithic. And when I say that, that is to say that no one is alike. We are all different. And when in conversation, it is best to ask the person you are speaking with what they would like to be called. Note that the personal care product industry or the cosmetic industry, when in marketing, they refer to consumers as Asian, Black, Latinx, or white. So our documents use this terminology, this terminology to distinguish between consumers when we're discussing market and sales. We have now discussed some of the context as it relates to culture and hair. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to our very own Dr. Michelle Romero Fishback, and she will be presenting on the background of hair straightening products. Michelle? Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I'm gonna give a brief uh, background to our topic today. Uh, next slide, please. So when we think about hair, uh, we tend to associate the hair types to different ethnic groups, as Michelle uh, just referred. And we can see an example on the first picture to the left. And for many years, this classification has been used by the industry to market different products. Uh, however, uh, hairstylists and consumers will consider different hair, hair textures, such as straight, wavy, curly, and coily to determine what products will be used and a specific uh, styling te technique. In other words, the physical hair characteristics or texture of hair, as well as the beauty standards uh, from the consumer will drive the type of products that are used, whether the styling is being done at home or at a salon. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we look at more specific or more detailed scientific studies, uh, we encounter that hair types can be further expanded based on different characteristics. In this slide, I'm showing um, that despite hair has been traditionally classified as straight, waved, or curly, uh, recent work has helped to further classify it. And this, is, this depends on physical characteristics, uh, such as three-dimensional shape of the fiber, curved diameter, uh, curl index, and the number of waves. As you can see, we have as many as eight different types on this, uh, on this picture. In other words, all human hair fibers uh, typically, typically have the same basic structure, and it is the three-dimensional shape of the entire fiber that has um, different, uh, differences or that differs considerably depending on the ethnicity. Uh, regardless of the classification, uh, the physical hair characteristics as well as the beauty standard from the consumer will drive, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, will drive the type of products that are used. Uh, next slide, please. So for women with wavy and heavily coiled hair, uh, regardless or of their ethnicity, the practice of straightening or relaxing their hair uh, may be appealing based pretty much on their own preference and other factors, uh, as Michelle previously mentioned. And in this presentation, we will be focusing on two main uh, types of hair straightening products. Uh, the first uh, category, and we have an example to the left, are called uh, permanent products. And these can make your hair straight for a few months. And this effect lasts even when your uh, hair gets wet. And on the second uh, big category, we have temporary products. And these products make your hair straight until it gets wet or it gets damp. And also, it depends on the frequency of washing or exposure to humidity. So the effect may last uh, for only a few days. And these products may be used more frequently compared to the permanent products, which are often applied uh, between six to eight week uh, periods. Uh, next slide, please. Now, specifically, when uh, we talk about hair relaxers, we are, we are talking about uh, chemical treatments that are designed to permanently straighten highly coiled hair. And they do so by breaking the disulfide bonds and they restructure these bonds. The products are typically sold as kits and these kits consist of multiple components, including a protective gel, a relaxing cream, liquid activator, and a neutralizing shampoo. 
Now, when it comes to hair strainers, the ones mentioned here are named either based on the country of origin or how they have uh, traditionally been marketed. Uh, the first example of this uh, that we have, and uh, as I'm showing here on the slide, is the keratin or Brazilian hair straining products. Um, these refer to two types of treatments. And the first one, uh, this one is, is very well known, uh, Brazilian keratin treatments, which usually contain formaldehyde and other keratin uh, smoothing treatments. These treatments entail application of the product followed by, uh, followed by heat treatment producing a smooth and shiny effect. Uh, the second group we have here uh, are the Japanese uh, heat strainers or thermal reconditioning treatments. And this can be thought as um, a hybrid between uh, keratin straighteners and hair relaxers. Now we have to take into account that uh, they use a two-step process that starts with a chemical treatment. And this chemical treatment utilizes ammonium thio uh, thioglycolate to break the disulfide bonds in the hair. Then uh, they use a neutralizing chemical treatment and heat also to restructure the bonds and then the, the hair becomes straight. It is not worthy that the entire uh, process of straightening the hair, regardless of the product that is used, uh, is uh, labor and time intensive. Next slide, please. So how does a hair relaxer work? Without going into too many, uh, too many technical details or going into the specific chemistry of it, I would like to introduce a visual uh, on, how, on how they work. First, uh, we need to remember that our hair is composed of proteins and these proteins are called keratins. And these keratins are stable in our hair uh, due to interactions between and within the, the protein chains. This is what holds them together and, they, uh, and our hair has a specific uh, shape. As you can see in the picture uh, on, the first, uh, on the first strand of hair to your left, uh, you can see that the, 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 these bonds are shown intact. And once the hair relaxer is applied, the diesel five bonds in the keratins are broken by the chemicals present in the product. And this will result in a breakage of, of such bonds between the keratin filaments and then they rearrange into the desired shape. Now, after drying and heating, in other words, uh, applying the, uh, the physical thermal shaping, an acidic uh, pH agent is applied to neutralize the process. And uh, this in turn reshapes the hair into the so-called uh, desired structure, which in this case, we're talking about like the straight effect. Now, uh, the hair will be pretty much permanently straightened uh, which in turn make, make the hair also more susceptible to breakage or split ends or other effects. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we, uh, or why us as a program have also, uh, has uh, these products have been in, in our attention? It turns out that the keratin-based straighteners have been the focus of several legal actions, policy calls, which have made these products a priority to our program. In the timeline that you can see on this slide, uh, I have included just some uh, relevant examples. And if if we can if we can look at the first uh, the first one, uh, we have that one of the earliest action actions happened in 2009 when a hairstylist in Oregon submitted a complaint to the state uh, to the state's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the hair the hairstylist reported experiencing health effects after using the Brazilian blow-up products. Uh, this complaint resulted in an investigation which revealed high, high formaldehyde levels in the salon air. Subsequently, the agency sent out warning letters to other salon technicians to inform them about this investigation. Uh, next, we have that despite a lawsuit uh, from the company over this action, uh, given that the formaldehyde present in uh, Brazilian blow-up products had, had, been, had, had been confirmed, the Food and Drug Administration at the national level issued warnings in 2011, and they were also alerting consumers of formaldehyde in these products. Now, by 2012, after a class lawsuit and a subsequent settlement at, at, in California, Related to this formaldehyde in the Brazilian blow up products, the, uh, some of the reparations included uh, first providing safety, uh, safety information sheet 
and a proposition 65 cancer warning on the containers, and also the need for protective measures such as adequate ventilation in the salons that we're providing uh, the services using these products. The next one was uh, ceasing deceptive advertising of the products as formaldehyde free and also using the word safe, engaging in substantial corrective advertising, including communications to, to sales staff regarding the product risks, and also requiring proof of professional licensing before, before actually selling the now so-called uh, salon use only uh, products to stylists. Uh, I, I really want to say here that this is just a partial list of the reparations. Uh, there are others that were included, such as actually uh, tackling the, the, the formaldehyde concentration in the products and others. Um, but for, um, for, for sake of time today, we, we're only going to focus on, on this. And now more recently, by two, uh, 2016, another lawsuit was filed by Women Voices for the Earth and the Environmental Working Group against the Food and Drug Administration, asking them to address the concerns raised about the health risk uh, associated with formaldehyde and keratin hair products. However, uh, this lawsuit was uh, was dismissed. And as of this year, uh, Women Voices of the Earth and the Environmental Working Group are still working on the subject. And now along with 75 salon workers from across the nation, they have filed a citizen's petition asking the Food and Drug Administration again uh, to take action on the formaldehyde, on formaldehyde present in these products. Uh, next slide, please. And another policy action I wanna highlight today, and it gets um, the, its own slide because it, it's also very important, is the passing of Assembly Bill uh, 2762, which is known as the California's, California's Toxic Free Cosmetics Act, which will ban formaldehyde among other chemicals by 2025. As you can see, uh, we have we have a list in this slide of, of the chemicals included in the bill and oh, some of the chemical groups included in the bill. And it is worth uh, mentioning that some of the chemicals in this bill have been found in hair straightening products as well. And it will be discussed later in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Now, it is not worthy uh, that during our research, we found that women of African descent began styling their hair at a very young age, particularly to straightening and or relaxing their hair. It has been reported that these practices can start as early as four years old. And this is particularly important as an early start of use, such as a longer window of span of exposure, a longer time for exposure, which may include critical life stages, such as puberty, reproductive stages. And in turn, this increases uh, the likelihood of exposure to chemicals in whichever chemicals are present in the hair products. Also, the continuous applications of these products may involve damage to the scalp, which may make it more susceptible to other damages and other scalp skin conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Now, recent research has been carried out to identify the, the chemicals present in hair relaxers. And a key study that we wanna highlight uh, dates from 2018, when a group of scientists found several chemicals present in hair straining products. And as shown on this uh, summary table, we can see that many of these chemicals have found or have been found to elicit uh, hazard traits. And based on these findings, we prioritize our screening research strategy. And one of the authors, we're uh, very grateful that one of the authors of this study, Robert Dodson, uh, is going to be covering this in more detail today. Uh, next slide, please. And We've covered uh, we've covered now a, a bit of this uh, background behind the hair straining products, but there's another uh, another factor that it is also worth of our attention, and this is uh, we need to consider when we use uh, or that the use of hair straining products uh, one cannot forget about the potential health effects linked to chemical exposure or to exposure uh, to chemicals present in these products. Here is. It is very important to take into account some factors that may exacerbate the effects. First, uh, we have that, as I, as I previously mentioned, that there's an early start of use of these products. 
Second, we know that traditional women of African descent and Latina women have had access, less access to health services. Third, we know that women of African descent and Latina experience a cumulative higher exposure to chemicals compared to white women, as it has been reported by the National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys, or NHANES, carried by, by the CDC. Now, one of the examples of, um, of potential health effects, and I want to caveat this, and I, I want to say, uh, I want to clarify that I'm not suggesting that there's a strict uh, relationship here, and it is still on, ongoing research. Um, it, it is uh, the correlation between hair relaxer use and breast cancer risk. Uh, there is substantial ongoing epidemiological research. And the findings have differed across different studies. For instance, the sister study in the United States, a cohort spon sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, found an increased risk of postal cancer for some hair relaxer users. While another study in Africa also found higher uh, risks of breast cancer for former uses of hair relaxers, uh, recent uh, results from a different cohort uh, in the also in the United States, um, the Black Women's uh, Health Study, reported no association of overall hair relaxer use with breast cancer risk for uh, women of African descent. Now, while the breast cancer risk uh, findings still warrant further research, the health disparities surrounding uh, women of African descent have considerable effects. That is, uh, th that, that is a well-known fact. And one, of, one example of this is the mortality rate reported by the CDC, which is higher for women of African descent compared to white women. Next slide, please. So where are we now, uh, the Safer Consumer Products Program? Um, well, as we have previously discussed, women of African descent use hair straining products that may contain chemicals of concern. This is particularly important since uh, the use of these products start, starts at a very young age, continues throughout their lifespan, including the reproductive stage. According to a recent survey, uh, the Taking Stock study in Southern California, women of African descent actually use more hair products compared to other women. And this includes uh, menstrual and intimate products. We also know uh, that some of these products may contain some chemicals of concern. And given that our program is dedicated to protecting uh, consumers' health, particularly those susceptible to exacerbated effects from chemical exposure, SCP has focused on researching potential concerns surrounding hair straining products. And in the next section, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lin Nakayama Wong, uh, will cover the current state of SCP research, and she will also provide some preliminary findings. Uh, Lin? Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction, and thank you for everyone joining us this morning. Today, I'll be presenting our preliminary research findings on hair straightening products. First, I'll go over the product types we evaluated, then discuss the exposure potential from candidate chemicals in hair straightening products, and finally, briefly summarize the screening research for each candidate chemical or chemical class. The functional use, hazards of concern, possible alternatives, and relevant regulatory actions will be presented. Of note, the alternatives identified were not extensively researched, and we acknowledge that they themselves may have some hazards. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, DTSC evaluated the candidate chemicals in both permanent and temporary hair straightening products. We focused on keratin-based products and relaxer kits. For relaxer kits, this included candidate chemicals in all kit components, not only the relaxer creams. Hence, we also looked at protectants, shampoos, and conditioners. We did not focus our research on Japanese hair straightening since the main active ingredient, ammonium thioglycolate, is not on our candidate chemical database. However, as in the case of relaxer kits, there were some candidate chemicals that are used during the Japanese hair straightening process that I'll also discuss. Next slide, please. The candidate chemicals we evaluated impact both people and the environment. For people, we're concerned primarily about dermal and inhalation exposure routes. Some of the candidate chemicals may be absorbed during the use of hair straightening products. In addition, 
A few of the candidate chemicals evaluated are volatile and may off-gas into the indoor environment, which can impact salon workers in a professional setting, as well as consumers in the home environment. Frequency of use and application of hair straighteners, as well as age of first use, are also exposure parameters of concern. As mentioned previously, girls of African descent as young as four years old have reportedly used hair straightening products. Cumulative or combined exposures from candidate chemicals and hair straightening products during adolescence may be related to adverse health impacts later in life. And lastly, inputs to the environment through down the drain exposures are, con are a consideration as well. Again, cumulative, cumulative exposures of chemicals to the aquatic environment are a concern in California since water is considered precious in our everlasting drought seasons. Next slide, please. The following table summarize the chemicals and chemical classes we evaluated, their functional use in hair straightening products, and some of the main hazard traits of concern. In total, DTSC conducted screening research on five chemicals, formaldehyde, sodium hydroxide, benzophenone 3, diethanolamine, and triclosan. Next slide, please. We also evaluated three chemical classes, cyclosiloxanes, parabens, and orthothalates. These tables will be available after today's presentation for you to look at more closely. I will now go into more detail on the research findings for each chemical and chemical class. Next slide, please. First up is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is used to cross-link or fix keratin treatments to the hair's natural keratin. Formaldehyde has been reported in recent safety data sheets, also known as SDSs, of keratin-based straightening products such as Brazilian blowout at concentrations ranging between 3 and 7% by volume. Historically, higher concentrations of formaldehyde were detected in keratin-based straightening products. Several hazard traits and endpoints are associated with formaldehyde. It is a human carcinogen and respiratory toxicant, causing irritation of the eye, nose, and throat. In addition, formaldehyde is a skin and respiratory sensitizer, resulting in um, allergic reactions such as asthma. Next slide, please. Formaldehyde is a gas at room temperature. However, it is highly reactive with water. As such, it is often found in aqueous solutions, which are referred to as formalin or methylene glycol. The US Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, evaluates formaldehyde in all its forms, including methylene glycol and formalin, since the hazards posed by these compounds remain the same, regardless of the name used to describe them. OSHA has set a permissible exposure limit of 0.75 parts per million for formaldehyde. This is the maximum concentration that a worker can be exposed to formaldehyde in an eight-hour workday. Possible alternatives to formaldehyde include glyoxal and other aldehydes such as glutaraldehyde. Formaldehyde and methylene glycol will both be banned as intentionally added ingredients in cosmetics in California starting in 2025 under Assembly Bill 2762. Next slide, please. Sodium hydroxide, also commonly known as lye, is used in both professional and consumer use hair relaxers to break the disulfide bond in hair and alter the curl pattern. DTSC's research found concentrations of sodium hydroxide below 2.5% in low lye relaxer kits. The severity of the hazards associated with sodium hydroxide are dependent on the concentration and exposure duration. Sodium hydroxide is an irritant to the skin, eye, and respiratory tract. However, at higher concentrations, it can be corrosive. Currently, no lye alternatives use strong bases such as calcium hydroxide and guanidine hydroxide as the active component in hair relaxer kits. Next slide, please. Benzophenone 3 or BP3 for short, is also known as oxybenzone, and this candidate chemical functions as an ultraviolet or UV filter to protect personal care products. Our evaluation found BP3 in relaxer kits and Japanese and temporary hair straightening products. The main concern with BP3 is its widespread detection in national biomonitoring studies. It is also a suspected endocrine disrupting compound and a reported photoallergen. 
In the aquatic environment, BP3 causes bleaching and ossification in young coral. Ossification is a stress response where coral encase themselves in their own bone material. Of note, this ecological endpoint has resulted in the ban of sunscreens containing BP3 in the state of Hawaii. Uh, next slide, please. DTSC evaluated diethanolamine, also known as DEA. Since it's a contaminant in DEA-related ingredients such as cocamide DEA and loramide DEA, DEA-related ingredients are commonly found in the shampoo component of relaxer kits, but are also found in some conditioner and leave-in components of relaxer kits and some keratin-based and temporary hair straightening products. The DEA-related ingredients typically function as surfactants, foam stabilizers, or thickeners in personal care products. Free DEA is a possible human carcinogen and respiratory toxicant. Of larger concern is the evidence that free DEA in products can react with nitrosating agents to form highly carcinogenic nitrosamines that can be absorbed by the skin when applied. Cocamide monoethanolamine may be an alternative to DEA-related ingredients. Next slide, please. DTSC evaluated triclosan since it was detected in a relaxer kit as reported by Helm et al. 2018. This study detected low levels of triclosan in the relaxing cream component of a no-lie relaxer kit marketed for children, even though it was not listed as an intentionally added ingredient. Triclosan is used as an antibacterial in various um, consumer products. Our market research indicates that triclosan is rarely used in hair products, and it may have been a contaminant in the Helm study. Triclosan is a candidate chemical due to its listing on national and California-specific biomonitoring lists. Triclosan is also a suspected endocrine-disrupting compound based on animal studies. That said, triclosan appears to be phased out of all personal care products. Next slide, please. Cyclosiloxanes are the first of the three chemical classes that I'll be discussing today. Cyclosiloxanes are cyclic, volatile, methyl siloxanes used in conditioning and smoothening agents in temporary hair straightening products and the conditioner and leave-in components of relaxer kits. DTSC focused our screening research on three cyclosiloxanes, octamethyl cyclotetrasiloxane, decamethyl cyclopentasiloxane, and dodecamethyl cyclohexasiloxane, otherwise known as D4, D5, and D6. Cyclomethicone is mentioned here because it is a mixture of several cyclosiloxanes I just listed and a common ingredient in personal care products. Cyclosiloxanes are volatile and have been detected in the indoor air environment. Environmental persistence and bioaccumulation are the main hazard traits associated with this class of compounds. In terms of toxicity, the hazard endpoints vary from compound to compound. D4 is a suspected endocrine disrupting compound and female reproductive toxicant based on animal studies. D5 does not have estrogenic activity, but inhalation studies in female rats found an increased incidence of malignant uterine endometrial tumors and oral D6 exposure in rats associated with liver and thyroid effects. A possible alternative identified specific to cyclomethicone is isodecyl neopentanoate. Next slide, please. We also researched parabens as a class. The five parabens on the candidate chemical list are methylparaben, ethylparaben, butylparaben, isobutylparaben, and propylparaben. Parabens are used as fragrance ingredients and or preservatives in both permanent and temporary hair straightening products. Parabens are candidate chemicals due to their designation on biomonitoring lists. They've been detected in various human tissues and samples such as breast tissue, blood, breast milk, and urine. The main hazards associated with parabens are their endocrine disrupting activity that results in female and male reproductive and developmental effects. While parabens are not listed as carcinogens on authoritative lists, there is some evidence in cell lines indicating that they stimulate breast cancer cell proliferation, migration, and invasive activity. Uh, next slide, please. Possible alternatives to parabens identified may include phenoxyethanol, sorbic acid, and benzoic acid. The European Union 
has banned or restricted the use of several parabens as preservatives in cosmetic products. Mixtures of parabens should not exceed a concentration of 0.8%. For purple paraben and butyl paraben, the maximum concentration allowed in cosmetic products is 0.14% and prohibited in diaper area products. Starting in 2025, California will ban the use of isopropyl paraben and isobutyl paraben in cosmetic products. Next slide, please. Lastly, DTSC researched the class of orthophthalates with a focus on diethyl phthalate, DEP, and diethyl hexyl phthalate, DEHP. Phthalates are not listed as intentionally added ingredients in hair straightening products. The previously mentioned Helm study detected DEP at concentrations higher than DEHP in hair relaxer kits. DEP has been found in many personal care products, including hair straightening products. DEP is most likely added to hair straightening products as a fragrance carrier, and fragrances do not need to be listed on ingredient labels. DEHP was only detected at low levels in two hair relaxer kit components, which included an activator and a lotion. Some hazards associated with these phthalates are endocrine disruption, reproductive and developmental toxicity, and carcinogenicity for DEHP only. DEP is listed on biomonitoring lists for most of these hazards. However, it is much less toxic than the other phthalates and is allowed in cosmetics in the European Union, which has very strict regulations for cos cosmetic products. While structurally similar to the longer side chain phthalates, which have clearly demonstrated developmental effects on the male reproductive system, only very limited effects on DEP on the male reproductive system have, it, have been observed at high doses in animal studies. And the associations between DEP exposure and reproductive effects in human epidemiology studies have been inconsistent. Recent systematic reviews of many different human epidemiology studies have found only inconclusive or slight evidence of associations between most health endpoints and DEP exposure. There is stronger evidence to support an association between DEP and other phthalates with an endpoint of preterm birth. Possible alternatives to phthalates may include essential oils. Starting in 2025, California will ban the use of DEHP in cosmetic products. Next slide, please. We've covered a lot this morning, so I'd like to summarize some of the key points from our presentations. We've briefly provided a social context of hair and how it affects the hair straightening experience of women of African descent. Whether it's due to rigid appearance standards, hairstyle trends, or personal preference, people of African de descent should be able to wear their hair without it posing a health risk. We provide provided background on different hair characteristics and how it varies depending on ethnicity. We touched on the health disparities in women of African descent and how it may be linked to chemical exposures in hair products. We introduced three types of permanent hair straightening products, hair relaxers, keratin-based and Japanese hair straightening products, as well as temporary hair straightening products that were researched in our screening evaluation. We presented our preliminary research findings of five candidate chemicals and three candidate chemical classes that were found in these hair straightening products. From an exposure standpoint, parameters of concern include the frequent use or application of hair straightening products, as well as sensitive subpopulations exposed. Salon workers, as well as women of African descent are considered sensitive subpopulations. Also included are girls of African descent since they can be exposed to these products at a young age and these exposures to candidate chemicals during adolescence may be related to adverse health impacts later in life. Next slide, please. In addition to my co-presenters, Michelle banks Ordone and Michelle Romero-Fishback, Romero I would like to acknowledge our awesome project manager, Christine Papagni, and the rest of our team, past and present listed here, who have worked tirelessly on researching the chemicals and their nuances in this product category. Now I'll hand it back to Michelle banks Ordone to facilitate clarifying questions. Thank you, Dr. Nakoyama Wong. Um, before we move to comments and secure additional feedback, we'd like to know if there are any clarifying questions you'd like us to address. Uh, joining me in addressing some of these uh, questions or at least reading them from our Q&A will be Armin Etimad from our team as well. And I do see here 
that we have questions that have been asked in the Q&A. If we could go to the next slide, I want to ensure that everyone who is participating, next slide please, has an opportunity to remember how you can actively participate. Again, feel free if you want to ask your question verbally to raise your hand or simply type in the chat, which most of you are doing. If you are joining us by telephone, uh, press star nine to raise your hand and we will also be able uh, to call you for verbal comment. So at this time, I would uh, suggest that we begin with some of the questions that came in while we were giving our presentation. I believe the first one was from a Mr. Mike Cantrell. Uh, does this apply to articles or just to chemical straighteners? Um, that is a question that he asked earlier in the presentation following our project manager, Christine Papagni. Um, sure. Thank you for the question, Mike. Um, assuming you mean, does it just refer to the straightening components or if it also, or if we may prioritize some of the other products that are included, for example, in a relaxer kit, um, we're still making that decision. We've evaluated um, several of those product types that are included in addition to the straightener itself, but are, that are used as components of the straightener. Um, and we'll make, based on some of the comments and feedback we get today um, and some of our own research, we'll make, be making decisions on that. Thank you, Christine. Our next question also came from Jennifer Ortega. Um, what does cell migration mean on the paraben slide? And I believe, uh, Lynn, that may be in reference to your slide on parabens. Yeah, I, I apologize. I actually don't remember the study metrics and I can get back to you offline on that specific um, endpoint. Thank you so much, uh, Lynn. So Jennifer, we will get back to you with that particular question. We have a series of additional questions. Yes, I see one question from Tabitha Odell. Uh, who says, no manufacturer recommends a relaxer to be applied to any child under the age of six. Where did you get the information that people start relaxing at four years old? Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, we obtained this information from a survey uh, and this survey was published uh, by Wright and colleagues. I'm gonna be pasting the full reference in uh, the chat to all panelists and all attendees. I wanna say that um, I did not mention that, that it was uh, a recommendation. It was more um, a statement as it had been reported from users who were surveyed uh, by these authors that they, they started or the youngest uh, person who was using the products was reported of four years old. Uh, and, and this is, uh, the reference should be in the chat box. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, our next me. question comes from LaDonna Williams. I also see your hand raised. So I'll go ahead and read your written question first and then uh, unmute you so that you can list your verbal clarification as well. Uh, so LaDonna writes, uh, sorry if I missed it, but do you have a chart showing chemical relaxer uses percentages by race? Um, I you did not miss it. I apologize. I did not include one chart on 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 my slide deck. Uh, there is there there is a, a chart uh, that was done by Dr. Uh, Robbie Dodson and in um, in her recent uh, publication. I'm also going to be pasting on our chat box. I'm going to be pasting the full reference to the study. The study is a taking stock uh, study in Southern California, and they actually have this chart. Uh, it's in there for, uh, and I believe the study is also uh, public access. Um, are, are there any follow-up uh, questions 
to that to that specific question, Ermin? So, Ladonna, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you're able to talk to Michelle and the rest of the panel. Please go ahead and also list us your affiliation, too. Okay. Can I get in the uh, other queue? Someone's at my door. It is the monster of Zoom. Can I do it after I get the door, please? Oh, absolutely. Yes. All right, and our next written question comes from Tabitha Odell. Do you also survey how many black women who have natural hair and never use relaxer and have cancer and track those rates? Do you determine how many of those women have genetic markers for cancer or other health issues? Uh, well, thank you for the question. This, this, is, this is actually an important question, especially when we discuss uh, population studies, when we discuss epidemiological studies, uh, that, that, is, that is actually a very important question. I, I do want to say here for purposes of clarification, uh, in that part of the question, do you also survey how many black women who have uh, natural hair never use hair relaxers? I, I do want to say that us, uh, the Safer Consumer Products, we do not carry out these epidemiological studies. Um, as Christine mentioned in the first portion of the presentation, we do review the literature, meaning other studies that have been made uh, by researchers in different groups. We take that information, we analyze it, we review it, we put it into our documents. We do not do the surveys ourselves. Uh, it is beyond our scope. But I will gladly share also the references in our chat box for people who want to uh, review them more carefully. Uh, I believe uh, some of these factors that are being mentioned here are, are factors that are considered into the design of the study. And for each, for each individual reference, uh, there are different uh, factors that are being considered. So I'm, I'm going to add uh, the references in here as well. Uh, I don't know if anyone else uh, from our team wants to give additional information. Yes, thank you for that answer, Michelle. Um, I'd like to add that that is exactly the type of information we're hoping some of the experts can share with us. So if anyone has that type of information, please um, share it either through our email, uh, which is up on the screen, or if you could share it through our CalSafer portal, and there's a link to CalSafer on our website. Great, thank you so much, Michelle and Christine. Uh, LaDonna, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, so please list your affiliation along with your clarifying question. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, first I want to say I apologize. <laughs> the doorbell rang right at the same time. Um, LaDonna Williams with All Positives Possible is the name of our organization. So, uh, yes, thank you. You um, asked the first question that I had put in the question and answer. But the second one um, had to do with the actual, you know, people. Was there testing done of those that have used chemical relaxers for periods of time, say five years, 10 or 20? Has there been any studies, you know, done with that on the um, on the bio side? And then also, is it just this is um, safer products, chemical relaxers, but are they also including uh, weave hair products itself from hair tracks to synthetic uses to human hair, because particularly in African-American women, we're seeing baldness, um, not just on the edges from overusage of the creams and the relaxers, but throughout the head, we're seeing severe baldness. Um, and so I'm just wondering, are you guys also testing the hair itself? So uh, first of all, Ladonna, I, I apologize. I um, I did not carefully look for user use of weaves uh, or other uh, different types of uh, hair designs. Um, we were pretty much focusing and looking actively for hair straighteners and relaxers. I am partially aware of the 
the, the conditions that you mentioned, such as alopecia, like, like, losing, like losing one's hair because of the, the application of some of the tr these treatments, uh, I, I believe uh, there, there are different dermatological studies related to it. However, uh, when we talk about testing uh, people for the use of hair relaxers and testing people for the outcome, in this case, uh, either uh, breast cancer or, or you name it, uh, that is um, traditionally what uh, epidemiologists do, uh, meaning uh, scientists who focus on the study of populations and uh, scientists who look at what, what's happening uh, uh, for human health outcomes. When it comes to these type of studies, uh, they actually follow, follow people throughout a period of time. So while they are following these people, they, they may ask some questions. So some of the information is reported by the people participating in the study. Or there are different cases where scientists take groups of people who already have a condition and compare it to people who do not have a condition. And this is, this is uh, maybe like a little bit more of uh, the, the technical characteristics of the design. But I, I think what you're bringing up, it, it is very relevant. It is very important. We are aware of at least uh, partially of some of this information. But uh, at, at this point, we pretty much focused on the hair strainers and relaxers uh, specifically. So I do not have additional information on, on the effects of weaves or, or other hairstyles. Um, Christine, do you want to elaborate on the answer? Uh, yes, thank you, Michelle. And in terms of looking at other product categories, this is actually part of the feedback that we're looking for during this workshop. While, yes, we focused on hair straightening products today, um, our program is continually looking at health impacts from a variety of products. And so we do want your feedback, if there, especially if there are other personal care products that you recommend we look into, please provide that feedback to us. And hopefully we answered your question, LaDonna. Wonderful, thank you so much, Michelle and Christine. And uh, thank you, LaDonna, for your question as well. Uh, let's move back to some written questions from our Q&A. Uh, Alexandra Scranton has uh, two questions. Uh, the first of which is, were you able to find out if there were any candidate chemicals in the fragrance in the hair products you looked at? Uh, hi, Alexandra. First of all, uh, we are aware of the work, the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, I, I believe most of us in the team have read of some of the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you for the question. This is one of the parts that, that we are also being challenged with, and this is the fragrance, um, the fragrance ingredients. It is, it is very challenging to find publicly available information on the ingredients of fragrances. And I believe to the best of my knowledge within the scope of our work that was not touched on yet. Uh, Christine, um, am I correct? Uh, you are, and to follow up with uh, what Michelle's answer was, at least regarding the phthalates, we assume they were from the fragrance in the product. Um, but we don't know that definitively. They were not identified as ingredients in the product. And the only function that they would appear to have in a hair straightening product would be as part of the fragrance component or as a fragrance carrier. Um, but that's still a data gap for us as we know it is for many people. Fragrance uh, information continues to be challenging. Great. And Alexandra's second question is, did you assess the potential for cyclosiloxanes to emit formaldehyde at high heat, such as the heat of a hair straightening flat iron? Salon workers have reported similar symptoms with using formaldehyde containing and cyclosiloxane containing hair straighteners. I'll take that one. So we're aware of so during late, late in our preliminary screening research, we became aware of SDS sheets for safety data sheets for some cyclosiloxanes where it was a, a warning that if at high heat, that it could become a formaldehyde releasing or formaldehyde could be released. And so we were trying to 
suss this out a little bit better of how much formaldehyde could be released during these specific um, procedures and processes. But if you have, like Christine has said, um, we are gathering any of that data right now. So if anyone knows anything more specific or studies that are looking at um, the use of hot flat irons and release of formaldehyde with some of these products, we definitely welcome it. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, let's move on to uh, a question that we got from the, uh, in our SEP inbox that comes from Tabitha Odell. Uh, if you are not tracking non-relaxer users and relaxer users, how do you not know if it is a coincidence and not causation? This is this is a great question, and this is actually a question that a lot of epidemiologists uh, have to deal with whenever they are working on a publication. Uh, usually, when uh, when we when we think about these population studies, these human studies. There, uh, there, there, there is a set of criteria that every scientist who wishes to publish a study or who wishes to make a well-designed study has to uh, discuss in their in their findings. One of them is plausibility or the 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 feasibility that the exposure may be related to the outcome, and this is like a biological mechanism by which these two things are together. The other thing is temporality. Um, and this is like the time when it was measured to making sure that the effect did not occur before the exposure. And there are several other criteria such as these two that I just mentioned, but uh, I, could, I, I could really go into details about epidemiology is one of my passions. Uh, however, I, I think we need to keep the focus of our workshop a little bit narrow here, but I'm very happy to discuss offline if if they want uh, if if they want additional information on the the study designs and why we're considering it as as a as a um, solid and and very well designed study. And to add to Michelle's answer, um, part of the criteria of our regs uh, state that you know we evaluate chemicals and their potential for exposure and whether that exposure can contribute to or cause adverse impacts. So we don't necessarily need to um, entirely prove causation. It's meant to be a precautionary approach. If a chemical has a known hazard trait and there's health impacts associated with that chemical and there's exposure to that chemical from the product, um, that's enough information for us to consider prioritizing it and asking manufacturers to evaluate for safer alternatives. Great, thank you so much, Christine and Michelle. Uh, our next question comes from Adena Janos. In some of the slides, chemical alternatives were mentioned. Are data available on the safety and or effectiveness of the alternatives? I'll go ahead and take that question. Um, We've only done preliminary screening research so far, and actually some of our questions tomorrow during the panel discussion will be regarding alternatives um, to certain chemicals and hair straightening products and whether they're safer or not and whether folks have data they can share with us. So we're still looking for that information and we're hoping you'll share it with us. Thank you, Christine. Our next question comes from Evan Workema. Many of the adverse effects of sodium hydroxide are associated with the basicity in the straightening products, pH of 10 to 12, rather than anything unique to sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is widely used in other cosmetic products to neutralize acids. And while it appears on the ingredient list, it is not an irritation hazard because the finished product is near a neutral pH. Would it make more sense to regulate pH rather than the chemical itself? And I can go ahead and address that question. Um, we definitely welcome information regarding uh, both pH and concentration of sodium hydroxide in these products. Uh, that's something that we're still conducting research on. Um, and the rest of the panel has 
Anything else they'd like to add, feel free. Michael. Um, hello. Uh, the only thing that I would add on that is that, uh, as we mentioned, um, as Christine mentioned, we evaluate our chemicals in the context of the product. So exactly like if we were go specifically in this case, we we looked at sodium hydroxide as the active ingredient. Um, um, our concern is when sodium hydroxide is used as the active ingredient in uh, the relaxing cream, um, not when it's used for pH control or, or, or something else like in a, in a shampoo. And in that case, in order, I believe, in order for it to perform its function, that, that, that high pH is, is necessary. Um, so that's why um, we don't just regulate just the chemical. Uh, we, we, we regulate it. Um, or we look at it in context with a specific product and a specific use in an application. So it would be something like we um, focusing on sodium hydroxide um, for the purposes of hair straightening in a relaxing cream, not as pH control. Thank you, Michael, for the addition and answering that question as well. Uh, the next question comes from Latasha Russell. Can you provide a list of nitrosating agents and nitrosamines? Michael, will you please answer that question? Absolutely. Um, uh, here I am again. Um, that uh, nitrosating agents, um, what our research, what our research found is um, basically nitrosating agents or anything that can contribute nitrogen or, or nitrite, um, you know, that the free DA can react with. Um, it could come from a number of different sources, but in cosmetics, it's most commonly uh, some sort of contaminant in the in another ingredient. So in the case of like uh, these hair straightening products, um, what we found was there there is potential, and I want to you know I want to um, stress that it's potential that there is potential for um, some free residual um, DEA to be in the product, along with some of these other contaminating nitrates, like from salts or some other things that are also not intentionally added ingredients, to react together to form um, these nitrosamines like, um, and maybe Lynn can help me out, but like uh, the acronym is NDEA um, and, uh, and um, which are, are known to be highly carcinogenic. And um, there's, uh, I believe there's some citations in our background document and uh, we can post those in the chat as well um, to, to provide you some additional information on that. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, if you want additional information, the bulk of this information concerning nitrosating agents and nitrosamines came from a European Union report, um, the, safe, the Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety, and we can get you the citation for that if you want to read up on it as well. Great. Thank you, Thank Lynn. you, Lynn and Michael. Could either Lynn or Michael uh, find the reference so we can put it in the chat? Great. And while that's being done, uh, I'll read off the next question that comes from Ken Morena. Have you done exposure-based risk assessments for these chemicals, or are you comfortable just referring to them as hazards? So in the SCP process, we look at both exposure and hazard traits, but we don't do a traditional risk assessment when we do our evaluations because our evaluations are meant to be precautionary. Thank you, Christine. Uh, next question is from Latasha Russell. Can you give the link to the study that found triclosan in the relaxer kit? 
Uh, yes, we can. And that was uh, from a study from Helm et al. And one of the researchers, Robin Dotson, will be giving a presentation um, later in the workshop. And I believe the link to that study may have already been provided in the chat, was it? If not, we'll provide the, a link to it in the, in the chat. Thank you, Christine. Uh, next question is from Rachel Mahoki. Will this presentation be shared electronically? Uh, yes, both the, um, there will be a recording actually of this webinar um, workshop on our website following today's uh, workshop, as well as the slides for at least DTSC's presentations will also be provided. If people are interested in receiving the outside speaker slides, um, you would need to contact us and request those. Great. And we have a follow-up uh, comment from Evan Workema. What I'm getting at is that any high pH straightener will have the same irritancy concerns, regardless of whether the pH is due to sodium hydroxide or some other strong base. So it would seem to make more sense to regulate pH rather than an individual chemical used to create that high pH. Uh, Andre, would Andre's you like hand to up. address that question? Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, I'm Andre Algazi. I lead the chemical and product evaluation team here. Um, essentially, our regulatory framework is designed around identifying a specific chemical. So while your point is well taken, I, I think we're doing it, we're, we're identifying the chemical because that's that's the way our framework is set up. If there were other, you know, very high pH ingredients that were used, you know, we would evaluate those as well. But that's just sort of the way our, our regulations are set up. Thank you so much, Andre, for the clarifying question answer. Um, we also have another clarifying question from Tabitha Ordell. If you are not tracking both groups, then how do you know that it's not coincidence and not causation? I believe I answered this question uh, before. And uh, just a friendly reminder that Tabitha, uh, if, if you wish to, to reach out to us after the workshop is done, like we, we are happy to provide a lot more detail in, in, on this. And Andre, I see a hand raised if you'd like to answer that question as well. Well, uh, just more generally, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in certain references. I encourage people to look also at the background document that we um, published in conjunction with today's workshop because uh, there's a, a long bibliography in, uh, in there and you'll find a lot of the references we're talking about there. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to our audience for all the wonderful questions so far. I don't see any more queued up in the written Q&A or our SCP inbox, but if you'd also like to ask verbal questions, please go ahead and raise your hand um, so we can acknowledge those as well. Thank you, Armin. I see that uh, we don't currently have any questions to be recognized verbally and or in the Q&A. So at this time, we'd like to open it up. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. To both comments and public feedback. So uh, at this time, if you have comments related to the presentation you've heard today, or if you have had the opportunity to review the background document and would like to share some additional feedback and or comments, perhaps you also have additional uh, documentation, data, or information related to this subject matter because you are representing industry, this would be an excellent time to share with us. The process of doing so is the same in terms of actively participating. And if we would show the next slide on the screen so that all of our attendees can recall. Again, if you raise your hand, you can participate verbally. 
as well as typing information in the chat. That is if you are joining us online. If you are joining us by telephone, all you need to do is press star nine to be recognized and we will call the last three digits of your number, at which time you can press star six and you will be unmuted. So I see here that there is now um, a comment that is in the Q&A section. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, yes, I see a comment question by Samel Gaston. Uh, as discuss discussed by Michelle banks Ordon, there is now a trend towards wearing natural hair among girls slash women of African descent, which still often results in the use of multiple hairstyling products that are advertised specifically to Black slash African-American women. Will there be any future work related to natural hair products that are now being used with usually with greater frequency than hair straightening products, which may also contain potentially harmful chemicals such as parabens and phthalates? And that's a great question. Um, currently, we're focusing on hair straightening products, but we are, as I've said, we're looking for feedback. If there's products that people recommend we look at in addition to hair straightening products, we will certainly take that into consideration. And you make an important point as trends change and certain women are using, uh, are wearing their hair natural instead of straighten it, there are additional products that we may want to look at. Andre? Would you like to expand on that? Thank you. Yes, Christine. Uh, I just wanted to add that in our current work plan, um, as Christine mentioned earlier, our personal care and um, beauty and personal care products. So during the 2021 to 23 work plan period, we're going to continue looking at that product category. So as Christine said, we certainly welcome suggestions and um, we're going to be doing some kind of broader looking at chemicals and products in those uh, in formulated products. So um, it's it's not a current area of focus, but we could look at it, especially if we're given um, information that would help us. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I see a hand raised by uh, Jen Robinson as well from our panel. So if you'd like to chime in, please please do so. First, we have to come off of mute. Uh, thank you for letting me chime in. Um, one of the things that I want to acknowledge is that a lot of us who are wearing our hair, quote, natural, still put a great deal uh, of products in our hair from, from color to texturizer, et cetera. So it would be quite interesting to see um, some research on this. And I also want to say that that we absolutely need a great deal of research. And I would like to see some research by women of color and by Black women in specific to, to begin to get some of the answers to these questions. Um, from my experience with Black women of wellness, we are um, not adequately represented as principal researchers um, in the field. So just want to put that out there, you know, that that more funding is needed and more researchers, Black women are needed to begin answering some of these questions in a realistic way. Thank you so much, Jen. I see two hands raised in the audience as well. Um, first of which in the queue is LaDonna Williams that I'm going to go ahead and allow to talk. Please go ahead and uh, list your affiliation as well with your question. Yes, good morning again. LaDonna Williams with All Positives Possible. I wanna thank Jeanette, uh, I believe it was Jeanette Robinson Flynn. I saw her comment in the uh, chat and then I believe that was her that just commented. That was exactly what I was gonna point to is the lack of supportive funding uh, that focuses on African-American women. It's, it, um, and I keep hearing the term, you know, um, of color and we understand, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's necessary to include folks who use, you know, the products. However, there is a uniqueness when it comes to African-American women or black women 
when it comes to these hair products, particularly the relaxers that are used in conjunction with foams and, and waxes and, and just a host of other items that are combined together with the chemical, uh, chemical relaxers that puts us in a different category. Not only that, these products are being marketed directly to us and many of them are, are copies, are, are inferior products, but we don't know that. And so the fact that le the least amount of focus and funding goes into products that are unique to us. And yet in these spaces, when we say that we need specific focus on African-American there is always the, but no, we need to add others in there, but their issues are really not the same as ours. So I'm wondering, and I guess this is a question to DTSC um, or Cal EPA, is there needs to be a specific focus of funding for the researchers, as um, Ms. Jeanette mentioned, for that research and those of us that do this work that can provide that information that you need that no other group can provide. And so, you know, we want to unapologetically push for that focus on this population because this population is the most impacted and in, and, and in a negative way. Thank you, LaDonna. Uh, Michelle, would you like to chime in as well? I just, I just had um, a, a follow-up comment to, to LaDonna's uh, perfectly well put uh, statement. I was hoping uh, if if you have any, and I, I know you, you mentioned uh, that there's a need for, for the research and funding, but if at this, at this stage you had any information on this uh, combination of a number of products being used sort of in, in tandem or, or in addition to the straighteners, that information would be very, very valuable to us. Uh, as far as the, the funding allocation, I, I think it's above my pay grade. So if anyone else on, on our team or from management would like to address that, that would be great. Can, sure. can you still hear me or no? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, actually, um, our, our organization, we're an environmental justice organization that works on environmental health and a host of other things. But we actually took this on uh, back in, we were under another organization, People for Children's Health and Environmental Justice. And we focused on hair relaxers in young children. And that was actually back in 2000. And we literally could get no body to really support us trying to research this and find out, you know, like how it was impacting it. We saw it on the front line level of what it was doing to children and, and their moms. Um, but we literally could not get any help to focus on that. But also my profession before I got called to environmental justice was a cosmetologist. So I had been a cosmetologist since the age of 16. And so um, we have years of experience with the combination of products and the trend changes that had taken place. And so are the uh, community folks that are involved in our organization now that we focused on that. So I just wanted to say this is great, you know, information for us to be able to build on. And we're definitely willing to work with the agencies and the researchers in uh, collecting that data. And Andrew, to before, push for yeah. funding above your, your pay grade. Uh, thank you, LaDonna. Uh, Andrew, before you make your comment, can I ask, um, uh, LaDonna, as, as you just mentioned that, that you have experience as a cosmetologist and you have all this um, experience we would pretty much value uh, having or continuing this conversation after the workshop. Uh, if you would please uh, send us an email with your contact information or if, um, or if you would please send us a reminder so that we can keep this conversation going. Uh, we could benefit so much from having like an extended uh, conversation and hearing more about your experience. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you um, my email directly, but we do, we have perfect. worked with DTSC in other uh, areas as well, but I'll definitely 
forward it. Did you want me to send it to the safe consumer products or to you? Uh, to, to me personally, it would be great okay. too. I would love to learn more from your experience. I, 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 I will share with my colleagues, but definitely, um, I'm, I'm very much interested in, in hearing more about this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Ms. Williams' well-taken point about funding for research um, by Black women. And unfortunately, we don't have funds with which to give grants. We're just, we don't have, that's not in our budget or in our current uh, mission. So we definitely, you know, would welcome opportunities to facilitate connections between people with money if we know, know of them, um, but we, we aren't. We aren't those people. And secondly, I just wanted to sort of kind of circle back to Christine's earlier presentation about our process and where we are now as far as which products we ultimately will focus on. The, the team has been working hard researching the chemicals that um, Michelle talked about in the, um, uh, or that uh, Lynn and, and Michelle talked about the chemicals and products that they talked about. Uh, and where we are now is sort of showing our sort of very preliminary findings based on looking at the literature and talking to people so that we can maybe refine our focus on a subset of products. So um, uh, your input is valuable in helping us um, do that. So thank you. All right, LaDonna, do you have a clarifying comment or question? I, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I did. Um, that was Andre Alvazi, is it? Um, so I guess I'm I'm a little confused when he said, well, we don't have funding. Um, is he not part of DTSC? Manager at DTSC. We don't we, we, we don't give grants. We don't have money to give grants to people to do research. So you oh, you're a manager at DTSC. Right. OK, so even though you don't have it, Aren't you connected with Cal EPA? Because they do have the small grants and they have other ways of connecting funding though, right? So to say DTSC doesn't give you know funding for that, that's kind of confusing. Yeah, so I'm just speaking for the Safer Consumer Products Program. The agency is quite a large organization. There are probably, I don't know, five or 6,000 people in the myriad program. So I, I, I apologize if that was confusing. Um, Maybe some of the team have um, connections with uh, with those folks, but our program itself does is is you know a small program with fewer than fifty people, and we don't have um, a budget to give grants. But there may be others in the in the agency, and it sounds like you may know more about it than I do. Oh, okay. So you're under the safer consumer product. So what you're saying is under that umbrella, there's no funding available. That yeah, this yeah, it's just not part of our our budget or our, our current mission. So if you don't mind me asking, who would have set that up as a safer consumer products, but no funding to back it for the public, you know, if no one else, but at least for the public to have the confidence that this information and this, you know, communication would be valid. In other words, they put together this, but no funding to back it. Well, our, we primarily rely on published literature that's uh, published by, you know, academics um, that are doing research. So the, the, the legislature that created the program that told DTSC to create the program um, told us that we were to use, you know, reliable information that's publicly available and things like that. So uh, we weren't created as a, um, a program to facilitate um new research or to fund research. That's just the, the legislature set up the program the way they did and we're implementing the way we've been um, within the boundaries that they set for us. <clears throat> oh, okay. So then we just need to find out who it is that would fund this, this um, process so that we could uh, do the research and whatever related to safer products. It's just under you guys, you don't do it. So we would have to find funding through Cal, P Cal EPA that connects to you guys. Right. I think if, if you were funded by Cal EPA to do research that would give a, the type of information that we use to ultimately regulate products, that would be a win for everyone. I don't know 
how how that uh, funding program works or, or or what the criteria are. But um, in the scenario you're describing, that would be helpful to you, helpful to us. Definitely. Thank you, Andre. And also thank you, Ms. Williams. I uh, just wanted to add that in relation to the small grant funding with Cal EPA, that has actually been extended. And what I'm hearing from you, Ms. Williams, is as we are looking at this research and in its uh, preliminary stages, that we should also be looking for those types of partnerships. So again, I want to put out there that that uh, small grant funding time period has been extended. Um, and if you would share your contact information with me, um, we can speak to you uh, about that program in more detail. Um, and I believe I do have your contact information, but I wanna be sure my contact information is available on the website. And for anyone that wants it and needs that additional information, it's michelle.banks hyphen or don at dtsc.ca.gov. So thank you very much. I look forward to speaking to you about this in more detail. Thank you, Michelle. And if anyone missed Michelle's email address, you can also send it to staferconsumerproducts at dtsc.ca.gov and we will connect you with Michelle. And just to provide a little um, expansion or clarification on what Andre said about uh, our research funding, our funding right now is for our own internal research. So we do rely mostly on the research of others. And then we have a very small budget to do some in-house lab testing. So as some people know, um, we are in the middle of doing a lab project, um, a lab study on nail products where we're evaluating chemicals in nail products. And as of this time, we don't have a lab study um, plan for hair straightening products, but on a very small scale basis at times we have the ability to do that. Thank you so much for the wonderful discussion, both to our panel. Uh, Marcia, do you have a comment you'd like to chime in on as well? Yes, so um, good, good, after, good morning, everyone. I'm Marcia Rubin, I'm the supervisor for the Public Participation Unit in Chatsworth. I work um, with Michelle and uh, several other outreach specialists. The Cal EPA Small Grants Program um, gives up to $50,000 to um, nonprofits or tribes that want to um, contribute to um, creating environmental justice and writing environmental injustice. And so you have uh, that deadline's been extended to August. Um, once we um, have the, the budget for the state passed in the next week, we'll know um, exactly how much funding there is for that. Um, they are trying to get more funding for it. And we can, um, if you're working with us and um, you know on some of these types of projects, we can um, we can give you technical consultation. You would have to apply for the grant, so you could work um, with M Michelle Romero Fishback or some of the other team members here, um, you know, on that proposal. So you could get input from us to contribute to that. So I just want to make sure um, that you know anyone on here who's from a, a nonprofit organization, you know that that funding is available to you, and we're here to consult and support you. Thank you so much, Marcia, and to the rest of the panel and Ms. Williams as well for the wonderful discussion. Um, I'd like to move on to the last remaining comments and uh, hand raises we have. I'll first acknowledge a comment by Jennifer Ortega. Uh, here is the webpage for a Black professor at Harvard who is doing research on hair product use in Black women. And there's a link to Dr. Tamara James Todd's profile um, at Harvard. So thank you so much. I'll go ahead and post that. And um, I'd like also like to let you know that we have had uh, some correspondences with her as well. Um, and I also see a hand raised from Delcy Braganza. Apologies to everyone. Um, if I mispronounce anyone's name, feel free to correct me or your title as well. Oh, I see 
no longer there. Uh, so if anyone else has any written questions or comments uh, or would like to chime in verbally, please feel free to do so. And if there are no further comments or questions, I'll hand it over to Michelle banks or Dome. Thank you so much, Armin. Excellent questions. Thank you so much to all of our participants today. Um, we would like to at this time, I'm just incredibly excited, we all are, in letting you know of some of the upcoming presentations we have continuing in the workshop by our guests. Um, the first one is going to be overexposed and underrepresented, and that is going to be conducted by the Executive Director of Black Women for Wellness, Jeanette Robinson Flint, followed by Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and Hair Products Used by Black Women, and that's presented by Dr. Robin Dodson, a research scientist with the Silent Spring Institute. Um, occupational chemical exposures among hairdressers of color, a pilot study, will be done by Dr. Leslie M. Uh, Kiros Alcala. She's an assistant professor at John Hopkins University, as well as the use of hair straighteners in relation to breast and ovarian cancer risk by Dr. Alexandria White, a uh, Stedman investigator with the National Institute of Environmental Health, and the cost of beauty attitudes, beliefs, and hair product toxicity uh, by Dr. Dede Tete, a doctoral, a postdoctoral fellow with the City of Hope. And she will be joined by Phyllis Cook. Phyllis Cook is the founder and CEO of Healthy Heritage Movement. So again, you're not gonna wanna leave uh, for the whole day. You're gonna wanna come back after this break, because these are some very dynamic doctors who are with us today, and they have some exceptional presentations for you. But at this time, we are going to break. Um, and uh, on the agenda that you received, it indicated that we will extend this break all the way to 1130. We don't want to wait that long. Uh, we have time and we certainly want you to engage with all of our presenters today and have the time to do so. So we are going to break now for about uh, 15 minutes. We're going to ask you to come back at 1115. Again, we're going to ask you to return to us at 1115 and we'll proceed at that time. Thank you so much for joining us for this earlier segment. Again, it is now 1115. Welcome back. Uh, the next phase in our workshop for today will include five amazing presentations by our guest, the first of which is titled Overexposed and Underrepresented. And that will be presented by Jeanette Robinson Flint, the Executive Director of Black Women for Wellness. Director Flint. Good morning, it's still morning, I take it. Oh, <clears throat> let me uh, adjust my video so you all can see me. Okay, there we go. Um, good morning. First of all, thank you for inviting me to participate and thank you all so much for this wonderful presentation, this wonderful information that you all have shared so much um, this morning. I almost feel like saying, yeah, that's it. We don't even have to uh, listen to my presentation because you all covered so much ground and so much territory. But since we planned it, we'll go forward with it. So it's overexposed and underprotected. Uh, and this actually is kind of a play on a quote by Malcolm X. And uh, in his presentation, he was saying that Black women are the most unprotected women in America. And when it comes to uh, our exposure to chemicals, we are overexposed 
and we are underprotected and overexposed meaning that we use a great many chemicals uh, and we are targeted by marketers and um, and for other reasons that we'll go into. And we are unprotected by regulations, um, by um, rules and guidelines and laws and policy from some of the harsh chemicals that we are overexposed to. So that's what we're gonna talk about right now for a moment or two or for 10 minutes. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Black Women for Wellness. Black Women for Wellness is 23 years old. We are committed to the health and well-being of Black women and girls. We are located, our, our home office is in Los Angeles, California. Uh, we also have an office in Stockton, California. And basically, we do our programming through programs, uh, which is direct hands-on services. We do research which I'm gonna tell you a little bit in talk, taking stock and we do policy. So we'll talk a little bit about policy also. So next slide. Black women are often exposed to chemicals and beauty products that are linked to early puberty, obesity and increased risk of breast cancer. So what I wanted to call attention to, uh, and I took notes earlier when we talked about age four was when one slide mentioned that uh, black girls are, are exposed to chemicals as early as that age. So I want to note that age four is about the time that black girls enter school, um, preschool, kindergarten, that age. And that's the age where we start wanting to be fit in and start looking at European beauty standards or start being judged by European beauty standards. So that's why those products and that product use, uh, that's where it begins to really play predominantly in our lives. What mom doesn't want her daughter to be considered pretty at school? And what is the value of being pretty? Um, well, actually there's a financial and economic value to it. Next slide. So African-American women, um, I'm not gonna read to you all, um, but sadly, we we are have caught up. It used to be that African American women um, did not die and have as much breast cancer as other women, but sadly, we have caught up. And and it is good that those who encounter breast cancer are more likely to survive. It is sad that this health disparity is increasing. Um, next slide, please. Black women are also more likely to have more other health conditions and chronic illnesses that come from endocrine disrupting hormones. Uh, here it talks about uterine fibroids, infertility, preterm birth, early puberty. Um, and I would say that 80% of the Black women I know have had an issue with uterine fibroids. Um, if we look at the data around preterm birth, um, that is birth before 37 weeks, we find that the highest numbers are with Black women. And early puberty and has... Um, uh, some dire consequences for Black girls, i.e. Uh, they are considered adults at a much younger age and therefore treated like adults and sexualized and exploited. So these are some of the other um, impacts of, of this use of or overexposure to the, the chemicals in these products. The product that we have here is just for me. And the one thing that I want to say um, is that the marketing companies are really good at marketing to young black women, well, act, actually at marketing hair care products to, to black women in particular. But for Just For Me and some other products, uh, we 
in partnership with Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, did some studies about where these products are placed in stores. We went into uh, stores in Black zip codes in Los Angeles County and found that the products are placed at a child's eye level. So if you are in a grocery store or in Targets or in CVS or Rite Aid, and you are in that part of the store with your child, they will find those products looking very uh, colorful with pictures of them at their eye level. So another reason why uh, young Black uh, girls are targeted with these products and another reason why we use them in, in overabundance, I think, too. Next, please. So defining beauty standards. Um, well, the one thing we did not talk about this morning was racism and the impacts of anti-Black racism. We kind of danced around it. And, and I really love Michelle banks or Dunn, um and Michelle Romero Fishback's presentations, but we did not use that word anti-Black racism and the impact of anti-Black racism on Black women and girls, right? From the point where if you are, you know, a four-year-old or five-year-old entering a school system with books that or lessons that don't reflect you or your history or don't paint you in a positive manner to the fact that who gets hired and who makes more money and are, can give you personal examples of how dark-skinned women with uh, curly hair or nappy hair have uh, been discriminated against. It is why we needed the Crown Act. It is why we had the list of, of uh, lawsuits that that Michelle Banks were done pointed out because of that discrimination, which impacts your financial status, which impacts where you live, and your zip code absolutely impacts the health and well-being and your your longevity of life. So when we talk about how our current beauty standards are impossible goals. Right, you had to be impossibly thin. You had to be impossibly um, light and white and blonde and blue eyed, which most of the world is not. And if you are not, then the structural racism reinforces um, your use of products and your. Um, your efforts to try to reach those beauty standards, and then that impacts your health and well-being. It impacts chronic illness, and it impacts your longevity of life. Next, please. Next slide. Black women spend over $8 billion annually on beauty products. Uh, we spend more than other uh, racial and ethnic groups, though they are catching up with us. And this is on hair products. We spend twice as much. Um, but the other beauty products are just are makeup, moisturizers, um, and all the, the things that we use from nails to to lotions that um, have chemicals in them and fragrance in them. Uh, the first self-made millionaire that we talked about was uh, Madam C.J. Walker. There's also the woman who taught her, uh, Annie Malone, um, who, who was the first millionaire. Uh, and, and taught Madam C.J. Walker the business and created that, that multi-level marketing business and a beauty industry. Um, and even today, uh, just recently, I met a fourth generation beauty college owner. So, and his great-grandmom 
started Universal Beauty School in 1929. So they are looking at celebrating 100 years in the Black beauty industry. So it is one of the more enduring industries in the Black community also. And um, that has its influence and impact also. So the, the last point I want to make in terms of the beauty industry, uh, Black Women for Wellness has uh, offered in partnership a couple of policies or bills and legislation around the beauty industry or impacting the beauty in industry, asking them to reveal uh, what are some of the ingredients, particularly the toxic ingredients in some of their products. And the beauty industry is very much a player in the, the policy arena in terms of, of having relationship with our elected officials and able to influence them also to take policy off the table, to vote in their favor and to <clears throat> abstain um, when they feel like it's necessary that it should be done. So we should not underestimate the influence and power of the beauty industry and that that $8 billion is not all spent on manufacturing, but it is in the political arena also. Next, please. So why is this important? Because black women suffer more from the toxic chemical exposures. Um, what are some of the solutions? We need more research. We talked about this earlier. Um, we, we, the hair relaxer uh, is used to, to, it is, it drives the, it mimics estrogen that drives fibroids. Uh, the detangler use comes in very early. Um, I have daughters and I remember wanting very much to use a detangler when it came time to comb their hair. Uh, dark hair dyes in, uh, are, you, are said to increase the risk of breast cancer and um, the earlier that young uh, girls develop pubic hair and breasts, the more they are adultized and the more risk they are um, for different types of cancer. Next fire slide, please. So we talked a little bit about um, some of the programs that Black Women of Wellness is doing. Uh, Behind the Chair is our program that is celebrating the Black hairstylists, and uh, this is our effort to organize the hairstylists. I um, mentioned Annie Malone and Madam C.J. Walker as two of the pioneers and trailblazers in the beauty industry. Um, but what we also recognize is even though um, this is an industry that has a lot of cash flow going through it. It is also an industry where the professionals are highly impacted by the exposure to toxic chemicals. So whereas I might go and get my hair done every two weeks if, if I'm good or once a month, these women who work in the beauty industry and men are exposed eight, sometimes more uh, nine, 10 hours a day, and um, by the number of heads that they do. So that is why we are interested in organizing them and why we are interested in their health and well being, because they are an economic pillar of the Black community. Next slide. Uh, this is another program that we are doing uh, with the uh, beauty industry. Curls and Conversations, a lot of folks now are doing natural hairstyles and a lot of folks are beginning to create their own product. And a lot of people are really trying to figure out um, what is the impact of the, the products that we're using and our health status. So this is one of the ways that we are attempting to not only maintain a dialogue and share information with the, the beauty professionals and the lay hairstylists in our community, but it also is informing us about trends that we need to look out for. Next slide. I'm going to move faster. Next slide. Um, 
we published a series of, of cards called Styling Safely. And um, we published these cards as a thank you gift to all the hairstylists uh, who participated in our research. And I will uh, show you a slide in a moment about our research. But basically, one of the things we did not want to do was come into our community, gather research, publish it, and then not acknowledge what we found in terms of, of information and not give that information back to the people who so graciously shared their wisdom, knowledge, and experience with us. So the style and safety cards that we uh, published was one is our occupational ergonomics. Basically, a lot of hairstylists are suffering from carpal tunnel um, syndrome or that syndrome of doing the same repetitive motion over and over. So we um, helped create a series of exercises to break that up. We uh, did another card on reducing exposures um, and um, personal protective care. We talked about PPE before the pandemic. And we also talked about how to give more information on the products that you were using. Next, please. Taking stock is the study that uh, we are engaged with right now. And I will go right past this and let Robin, our next speaker, talk about that in the interest of time. Next. And this is where uh, we are doing our work in Los Angeles uh, and also in Stockton, which is in North Central uh, California. So you all might know that California has a population of 10 million people and uh, approximately six, seven, eight percent, depending on who you're talking to, of those are African-American, but we are also looking at Latin, Latinx communities also. Next slide. Um, it is an ongoing place-based exposure for communities of color, like I said, black and brown communities. Um, we are operating under an environmental justice uh, framework. We are looking at organizing salon workers and beauty industry professionals. And um, we, we actually had a lot of conversation because of this word professionals in, in the beauty industry. A lot of lay professionals are also doing hair on a regular and continuous basis. Um, we talked about the licensing of beauty professionals and how the Beauty and Barber College, the BBC, does not necessarily have a a great amount of knowledge on how to treat and what is going on with black hair. So we are looking also at not only are those who are quote professional licensed, but those who do hair. Uh, and it is absolutely community engaged. I am from a community-based organization and the folks we um, work with and employ are community-based uh, workers who who are very interested and committed to our community. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so these are, are, are some of the, the issues that we were looking at in terms of colorism and um, who uses skin lighteners, um, hair texture. We're looking at cultural norms. Uh, and why we use so many uh, products. And, and some of the, the, the environmental injustice, but how racism plays out uh, in this, right? In, in terms of dark-skinned women and the, the colorism in our community in terms of who is employed and who's not, who's considered beautiful and who's not, and what impact that makes on your life. Uh, and your happiness or well-being factor. Um, absolutely, uh, hair texture is um, very much an issue. Uh, one of the examples I like to give uh, is with Michelle Obama. Um, someone of us might remember when uh, Barack Obama was running for office, they published a picture of Michelle Obama with a natural and a rifle uh, as a way to, to slander her. 
So, and um, if you have seen any pictures of Michelle Obama, you have never seen her in a natural hairstyle. Uh, once uh, the, um, the Obamas were elected, I'm gonna say it like that, um, they put their daughters in cornrows to go swimming in Hawaii. And there was such an uproar over that, that you never saw those daughters in a natural hairstyle again. And that is so unfortunate because as children, um, to be actively participating in sports, which is a good health behavior, um, putting their hair in natural hairstyles makes the most sense. But because it was such an uproar, we did not see them in those hairstyles again. And that sent a message to young Black girls everywhere uh, about hair texture and um, about, you know, and it influenced and impacted their active participation in sports and their ability to sweat. So African-Americans, I'm gonna go down to the cultural norms around being clean and the influence that has on the products that we use. One of the things that Black Women for Wellness is engaged in right now is uh, a battle with Johnson & Johnson because we've asked them uh, to remove the talc from baby powder uh, and to take it off the shelves and to take it off the shelves of the 99 cent store and to stop making it. And despite the fact that they are using losing millions of dollars in lawsuits around tout, they still have it on the shelves. Uh, and it is one of those products that we use around cleanliness um, because of the racial stereotypes that, that Black women are continuously trying to battle. Next, please. So that's what we are, just in terms of the, the radicalized beauty norms that we have to um, face on a regular and, and continuous basis, the beauty products to help us, not help us, but um, that we use to change that beauty um, standard so we're more acceptable. And then the adverse health outcomes that come from using those beauty products that contain toxic and very harsh chemicals. Next, please. Mm -hmm. And, and this is what I talked about, just in terms of the, the structural racism, the dress codes, the hair codes, the, uh, the marketing that's targeted toward us, the cultural norms that, that are close to impossible to, to shift, the peer pressure that reinforces those cultural norms, the internalized racism and the beauty rituals that we perform to make us feel better, to help us negotiate. The, the structural racism on a daily basis. Next, please. And I should say uh, that Amy Zolta and Bhavna Shamsunder are my research partners. They are both women of color. Uh, they are not African-American or Black women. And I will say that um, it is not easy for women of color, it is not easy for black women to get research dollars to, to do the work that we're doing. So once again, I know that uh, the next speaker, Robin, will be talking about taking stock uh, and the work that we are doing right now. Um, one of the, the features of this study is that we are actually able to do biomonitoring so we are actually able to um, ask women uh, to, to give us samples so we can see what chemicals are left in their body from the products that they use. Uh, one of the things that I hope Robin will share with you is that many of the products uh, that we use have incomplete chemical uh, ingredients listed on their labels, which is one of the reasons why our policy was about getting um, um, complete disclosure of the ingredients in the products. If we don't know what is in the, uh, the product, then we can't make an informed decision about whether to use those products to overexpose ourselves. 
Next, please. Okay, I just got the one minute warning. So uh, I wanna move on and not talk about taking stock because I know Robin will do that. Next slide, please. Um, yes, uh, next slide, please. I'll let Robin talk about some of this and next slide. So what I wanna go to, um, rather than talk about the, the study, uh, I wanna talk about, because we know that there's a problem, what I wanna get to is the solution. So next slide, please. And that is the authority of, and we, we started this discussion this morning, the, the authority of the FDA, the EPA, and DTSC. So the, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, uh, is responsible for protecting public health. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency is responsible for protecting public health also. So, and DT, the Department of Toxic and Substance Control is to protect California's people, communities, environmental from toxic substances. So how do we use uh, these agencies to protect our health? How do we use these agencies to um, create rules and regulations? that protect our health. One of the my favorite things to say is we cannot shop our way out of this uh, situation. So, and what I mean by we cannot shop our way out of this is that if we do not, um, if we do, if we do not shift the institutional and structural racism, we will always be trying to figure out, we being black women, how to fit in to a system that doesn't want us to fit in. That's number one. But number two, what happens is if we are if we do not have rules and regulations, then it is incumbent upon the consumer, i.e. the client, to figure out what's safe and what's not. And we will find that the the products that are safe will cost more money than the products that are not safe. So therefore, it will leave lower economic women more subject to toxic and um, harsh chemicals than those with a higher education or a higher economic status. So that means that we have to use the authority of the governmental agencies to create policy, to create legislation, to create um, regulations that protect us as a, as a consumer, as opposed to have it burdened upon the consumer to figure out how to protect ourselves from um, these, these harsh chemicals, from the marketing, and from the manufacturing distribution of toxic chemicals. Next slide. So that's what we can do. We can do a cultural shift and examine our, our beauty values. We can create better policy so it's not incumbent upon individuals, but incumbent upon our uh, society to, to protect us. We can do better training uh, and more training of the beauty professional industry. We can do education and awareness of our consumers so they can create a demand for safer products. Uh, and um, create a, and that gives me a whole thing about greenwashing, but I don't want to, to talk about that right now. Um, we can hold our elected officials accountable to pass legislation that protects our health and well being. And we can continue to research so we do know if there's a direct correlation or what the correlation is between harsh chemical use, uh, increased cancer risk, and increased mortality from harsh chemical use. So that's what we can do. And that's where I will leave it because I think what I, the message that I want to, to leave with you all is that there are things that we can do and that um, it is not always about the individual, but it is about creating cultural norms and practices also. Thank you. And that's it for me. Uh, unless, of course, we want to add, I will put in, um, we already dropped in the link for our um, Kim card 
and you can download it from our website. And also we will share with you our website so um, you can catch up with us later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Director Flint. That was an excellent presentation with a wealth of information. Um, before we move on to our next presenter, there is actually one question that was shared in the Q&A. We will take that one right now for you and then we'll move directly into the presentation um, that we have from Dr. Dotson. And that question comes from our Safer Consumer Products email line and it indicates Black women also spend more money on clothes than any other ethnic group. How is that a determining factor? I want to go back to this, the issue of the anti-Black racism that we are experiencing right now. And that Black women spend a great deal of attention, time, resource, and energy on how to fit in, right? On how to um, not be intimidating and we do this so we can survive. We do this so we can support our families. We do this so, um, so we can to, to maintain our health and well-being, right? Um, that's why we spend so much money on um, cosmetics, on personal care products, on hair care, on clothes, because we are fighting that institutional anti-Black racism on a daily and consistent basis, doing our very best to fit in so we can live in peace. Thank you so much, Director Flint. Again, we very much enjoyed your presentation. Outstanding. Please stick with us. Um, there may be questions for you as well once we hear from Dr. Dodson. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to ask that we move our slides uh, on to the endocrine disrupting chemicals in hair products used by Black women. And again, our presenter for this segment is Dr. Robin Dodson. She is a research scientist with the Silent Spring Institute. Dr. Dodson? Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, it is a pleasure to be able to share some of our research with you today. Um, my name is Robin Dodson. I'm an exposure scientist at Sound Spring Institute. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are a nonprofit research organization in Massachusetts where we're studying the links between the environment and women's health with a particular focus on breast cancer. Um, so I'm gonna share some of our research on endocrine disrupting chemicals and hair products that are used by black women. Um, and this is part of a larger research effort that we have looking at exposure to endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals or EDCs. Um, nearly 20 years ago, we published some of the first measurements of these chemicals in our homes, um, in homes in Cape Cod. Um, and we found them in the air we breathe and the dust um, that our children incidentally in uh, ingest. Um, and that led us on a kind of a whole kind of pathway of our research to try to understand where these chemicals are coming from and then ultimately what the impacts they might have on our health, um, including uh, their relationship to breast cancer. Um, so this research, uh, in addition to studying them in homes, um, next slide. Um, we started studying these chemicals, these EDCs or hormone disruptors in the products that we use every day. Um, so this is a paper that we published back in 2012 in environmental health perspectives where we looked at over 200 everyday products. So this is cleaning products. These are uh, personal care products like shampoos, um, makeup, even sunscreens. Um, and we did find that, uh, and, we and we measured uh, over 60 endocrine disrupting chemicals in these products um, and found that the majority of products had these chemicals in them, um, which really kind of reinforced the idea that these chemicals are in the products that we use every day. Then these chemicals move into the home or into our homes where we can and breed them um, and ingest them. Next slide. So they're in our, these chemicals are in our homes, they're in our products, um, and they're also in our bodies. So this is data from the national um, uh, health and Nutrition Examination Survey, this came up earlier, um, 
national biomonitoring, basically, uh, that has been being run by CDC. Um, and here are a subset of chemicals that are typically kind of referred to as personal care product chemicals. These are all phenolic chemicals, um, but they include uh, chemicals that you've already heard about today, parabens, triclosan, uh, benzophenone-3, uh, among others. And you can see that nearly all Americans are exposed to these chemicals um, in, their, in our bodies. We can measure them readily um, in most Americans. Next slide. But not everyone is exposed equally. So if we look at one of those chemicals, methylparaben, which is a preservative used in products, um, we can see that non-Hispanic Black women have disproportionately higher levels of this chemical in their urine compared to other women. Um, and this really um, raised some concerns for us, um, trying to look at, okay, well, these chemicals are in our homes, our products, and we know that Black women in particular are kind of more, more disproportionately exposed. Um, all of that kind of lines of evidence um, led us to develop a program, a research project uh, that we're trying to look at hormone disruptors in hair products commonly used by Black women. Um, so this is a paper that has already been referenced several times today. The Helm et al. Um, is conducted by Jessica Helm as a postdoc at Silent Spring, uh, among other researchers at Silent Spring. Um, and we uh, published this back in 2018. Next slide, please. So why study hair products for black women? Um, uh, Jan has already uh, talked a bit about this, uh, so I won't go into too much detail, but um, right, we know that black women suffer more uh, from more hormone related health problems than other women. That includes things like fibroids, infertility, preterm birth, early puberty, increasing rates of breast cancer and endometrial cancers. So they're, they have face a greater health burden to many of these hormone related problems. We also know that black women um, have more personal product chemicals in their bodies. That's right from the National Biomonitoring Program. And what's more is that we know that black women may use more or different hair products than other women. Um, this had been seen in some earlier work, particularly by Tamara James Todd. She's been referenced already. Um, and is also part of the impetus for what, why we are doing um, what Jan had just referenced, the project called Taking Stock Study. Uh, the Taking Stock Study is a community engaged uh, study uh, that's being done. Uh, Jan is running it uh, through Black Women for Wellness, as well as the co-PI is Bob Nishama Sunder at Occidental College in LA. Um, and so we're trying to really understand what some of these um, hair products, or not just hair product patterns, but personal care product use patterns are among women and how they might vary. Um, Jan kind of went through those slides rather quickly from some of the results from the Taking Stock study that have come out. Um, but we found in a survey of um, women across California when we compare product use, um, hair product use among uh, black women, Latinas, uh, Asian women and white women, we know that black women use, uh, use more hair products um, than other women. And when we think, uh, we, uh, we looked specifically at um, use of hair straighteners, perms or relaxers um, amongst the entire survey set, um, approximately 13% of Black women reported using those products within the last year. Um, and also uh, to note that 19% of Asian women also uh, uh, reported using those products. Um, and that is to say that, that the way we frame that question is rather broad, and, and you've already talked about it earlier today, that uh, hair straightening products can not only include the hair relaxers, but other, um, uh, other types of, of uh, straightening products. Um, we also found that women, particularly kind of in the middle age range of women from 18 to 54, tended to use more products, um, likely uh, related to their use potentially as, as professional for professional reasons. Um, and that some women actually in our study, in our survey, reported using um, hair relaxers, straighteners, or perms um, one to two times a month. Um, and that's a, you know, some women are using these products um, a lot and, and quite frequently. Next slide. Uh, so Janet already showed this, but this is again, um, kind of a nice framing for talking about why we're even thinking about personal care product use, hair product use as relates to, um, <clears throat> to women of color. Um, and it really is 
is, is based in um, these kind of racialized beauty norms. Um, so this, again, is a nice commentary written by um, some of our colleagues on taking stock, Ami Zoda and Bhavna Shamasunder. Um, but in the middle row there, right, that much of the use of hair relaxers um, and other hair care products among um, Black women is really because of hair texture preferences, trying to achieve the kind of Eurocentric uh, beauty norms um, because of professional and other reasons. Next slide. So what? Uh, let's go back to the, um, the HELM study. Uh, so the paper that we published back in 2018 um, was a first uh, study to test hair products used by Black women. Previous research had looked at the, um, the estrogenicity of products, um, but not looking for individual product, uh, individual chemicals. Um, so we tested 18 hair products for the presence of 66 endocrine disrupting chemicals. These included hair oil treatments, anti-frizz, leave-in conditioners, root stimulators, um, hair lotions, and no lye relaxer kits. Um, we got uh, the list of the specific products that we wanted to test um, from a, um, a survey that Tamara James Todd had conducted uh, while she was uh, doing her doctoral work at Columbia of women uh, living in New York City. Next slide, please. So these products, these 18 products were tested for a range of chemicals. So alkylphenols, including nonylphenol, cyclosiloxane, so D4, D5, D6, ethanolamines, including diethanolamine that has already been mentioned, uh, fragrance chemicals, including both those that are considered to be natural and synthetic, parabens, um, phthalates, and UV filters, including benzophenone 3. Next slide. So of the 66 chemicals that we targeted, we found 45 of them. Um, and they were not found in one chemical in one product at a time. Rather, we found multiple endocrine disrupt disrupting chemicals per product. Um, some had little as four and some products had as many as uh, 30 EDCs in them. When we compare our uh, the concentrations measured in these products compared to other available tests testing data, which some of which was our work from uh, that we had done previously, um, we can we found um, the concentrations tended to be kind of what we'd say like kind of the upper range of other hair products that have been tested at, um, at least up to this time. Um, in the hair products, we found seven chemicals that are regulated in California under their Prop 65, as well as um, or banned under EU and, and for use in cosmetics. Um, and five of these regulated chemicals were found in hair relaxers marketed to children. Next slide. Again, we're still thinking across all of the products here, all the hair products that we tested, um, uh, the majority of which contained paraben and diethyl phthalate, um, both of which have already come up, uh, diethyl phthalate being a, a um, a kind of a carrier for fragrance chemicals, or at least it's been correlated with fragrance chemicals that we've seen in our previous work. Um, and this is very much consistent with the exposure disparities that we can see in the national biomonitoring data. The hair lotions contain the highest paraben concentrations. Um, get back to another point that came up earlier, hair lotions are often used to maintain a kind of more natural hairstyle. Um, and all products contained at least one of the targeted fragrance chemicals. Cyclosiloxanes um, were found at the highest concentrations. In fact, in one product, one anti frizz product, it was found at up to 50, uh, 46% by weight. Almost half that product was cyclosiloxanes. Um, they were, those chemicals were not, though, found in any hair lotions. Next slide. So here is a figure from the paper. I apologize, it is kind of dense. I'll walk you through this though. Um, what this is showing is that we tested three different hair relaxer kits, two of which are marketed to children, one and three in this case. The hair relaxer kits tend to come as multiple component kits um, that you use kind of in sequence. And this is looking at those individual kit components separately. So, you know, the gels or the kind of creams that might happen at the beginning, um, all the way down uh, to the to the shampoos, conditioners, and lotions that might be used towards the end of, of the hair relaxing. On the left-hand side, we have all the chemicals that we were targeting. 
Um, so you can see them grouped by chemical class. And the deeper the purple or the darker the purple, the higher the concentration. Um, and so of these hair relaxer kits, we found parabens, phthalates, and fragrances were found in every kit um, that we, uh, in each of the three kits that we looked at. We also found cyclosiloxanes, alkyl phenol, ethanoliamines, and UV filters. Um, and, the, and the component that actually had the least amount of our targeted chemicals was the activator component. Um, that is not to say that the activator uh, component does not have chemicals of concern in them. It is to say that the activator component did not have these endocrine disrupting chemicals that we were targeting. Um, next slide. And here's what I had brought up earlier, um, but uh, kind of in a little bit more detail. Um, two of the no lie hair relaxer kits that were marketed for children is clearly for children um, with you know children on the on the front um, contain the highest levels of four EDCs that are prohibited um, for use in the EU. It includes DHP, diethyl hexyl phthalate, which has come up already, nonylphenol, which is estrogenic, BPA, bisphenol A, um, diethyl amine also came up as well as um, the Prop 65 orthophenolphenol. Um, and one of these kits contained all five of these EDCs. Next slide, please. And here's a, to a point uh, that Jan raised, um, is that um, many of these ingredients uh, tend to be unlabeled, uh, that where the ingredient lists are not complete, and that's in part because of chemicals that may be introduced by components or they are uh, some chemicals that may be there because of kind of catch-all terms like fragrance. Um, so for example, di uh, diethyl phthalate, DEP, is often uh, uh, not on any product label, but we find it to be correlated with the when the presence of fragrance um, is listed on the, on the label. Um, so of the 84% 80, of detected chemicals were not on any of the ingredient labels. Phthalates were never on the ingredient labels, for example. Um, now we did see that when you had, they were when they were found at higher concentrations, that's when you were more likely to be labeled, but still did not, um, uh, is not completely concordant. And the, the importance here is that it means that consumers cannot take steps on their own without adequate information to try to limit or reduce their exposure to unwanted chemicals. Um, it means that we cannot simply say, shop your way out of this. Um, rather, we need to kind of move upstream to think about ways that we can um, help consumers protect themselves from chemicals that are of concern, including those that are considered to be endocrine disruptors. Um, and, and, and really, it's something that we're we're working on it in a variety of different ways, right? Taking stock, we're addressing some of these issues around what people even know about what's the chemicals that they should be considering in their products. Um, and as Jan had mentioned earlier in taking stock, we are also looking at these chemicals um, in biomonitoring of the women who had um, done some uh, intense kind of documentation of the products, including hair products that they were using over a week. Next slide. So I'd just like to acknowledge the funding for this particular project, um, the hair testing product uh, project uh, from the Rose Foundation, Goldman Fund, Hurricane Voices um, for the Breast Cancer Foundation, um, and charitable donations to Silent Spring. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Dodson. Again, uh, an excellent presentation here as well. Um, I'm looking to see if there are any questions currently in our Q&A. Also, if you're joining us online, you can simply raise your hand in the reactions toolbar. If you're joining us by phone, please press star nine uh, and we will put you in the queue for Q&A. There is one question that has now come in our Q&A and that is from Janet Noodleman. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Dotson. You mentioned kit number one and kit number three, hair relaxer, I think for kids, had four EU banned chemicals. You make, uh, who makes these products? And go ahead. And she has follow-up questions, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, we did publish the list of the products, uh, names of the products that we um, looked at. Uh, one, um, is one that actually showed up on a slide earlier. Um, so it's the, um, 
well, there's soft and beautiful just for me, no lie conditioning kit was number one. Um, and number three was the um, pretty and silky, no lie conditioning cream relaxer. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. And are these big multinationals or smaller brands? No. Nope. So they are the bigger, they're commonly used things you would find on the shelf today. Okay. And her follow-up question lastly is generally speaking, are the majority of the products you tested made by the big multinational? Oh, cosmetic. Okay. So you've answered that. Thank you so much. Uh, Janet Noodleman, thank you so much, Dr. Dodson. I'm checking to see if we have any follow-up questions here before um, or any raised hands. We do not. Okay, and with that said, it is 12.08 and we will take a quick five minute break before we start with our next presentation. Uh, we will come back again, uh, actually at uh, 1215. So if you could come back at 1215 for use of hair straighteners in relation to breast and ovarian cancer risk. Oh, excuse me. Uh, actually occupational chemical exposures among hairdressers of color. A pilot study is next. Um, we will still take that five minute break. Forgive me, we are a little bit behind schedule, but we want to catch up here on our agenda, we know there was a typo. We do have information from some um, participants that they were looking to join us at the time of each of these. We're just gonna wait a few minutes and we will be back, um, let's say at 12.12, and we will start occupational chemical exposures among hairdressers of color, a pilot study. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, we are pending our presentation start. Uh, Dr. Lizem Kiros Alcala is an assistant professor with John Hopkins University. And momentarily, we will have a presentation, particularly for those of you who are just joining us, on occupational chemical exposures among hairdressers of color, a pilot study. So thank you again, um, and please, uh, Dr. Kiros Akala, if you are um, speaking, note that we are not able to hear you. Uh, we are going to ask that you unmute. I'm unmuted. And can you hear me? Thank you. Now we can hear you as well as see you. Thank you so much. So good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm on the East Coast, so it's 3 p.m. for me. I want to thank the workshop organizers for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and today I'll be talking about some work that was conducted in my research group on occupational chemical exposures among hairdressers of color. Um, really briefly, all of my work really, um, as a researcher of color myself, all of my work is focused on understudied and underrepresented populations. Next slide. So really briefly, I wanted to start off with some demographics on salons and hairdressers in the US. So according to the 2020 U.S. Census Bureau, it is estimated that there's about 77,000 beauty salon establishments in the U.S. And combined with barbershops, these make an annual revenue of about $20 billion. Using the same uh, data sources, it is also estimated that there's about more than 600,000 hairdressers in the U.S. This is a predominantly female workforce with about 95% female. Also, the average age is 38 years of age. And why that is important is because essentially the average age is women of reproductive age or childbearing age. It is also estimated that about 70% are Caucasian women and the other 28% are women of color, including African-American or black. And I'll use these terms interchangeably in the, in the, in the talk today, as well as Hispanic, about 15% Hispanic or Latino. It is very common for hairdressers to work in salons that predominantly cater to their specific racial and ethnic group. And in addition to being a predominantly female workforce, this is also a predominantly low wage workforce as well. Next slide. So as we've heard from other speakers today, um, women of color, and in, in, in my case, I'm, I'm focusing on hairdressers, Hairdressers are exposed continually to different chemicals 
that have been linked to different adverse health effects, including, like we heard before, thick chemicals such as phthalates, which are added, added as fragrance components um, and present in many hair products, skincare products, beauty products, et cetera. There's also many different volatile organic compounds or VOCs, such as formaldehyde, which is present in many straighteners, toluene, and others. Now, these have been linked to different adverse health effects, including reproductive problems, respiratory and dermal, which is one of the, some of the most common um, health effects that you hear in this workforce, as well as cancer. Next slide. So what pushed and kind of drove this work is the fact that, you know, in terms of what we know about occupational chemical exposure in this population, there really isn't much out there. There's a lot of existing data gaps. For one, there's very few studies that have focused really on a limited number of indoor chemicals in salon settings. Most of these studies have also been conducted outside of the US. In addition, epidemiologic studies, um, their findings have been limited and, incons and or inconsistent. Most of these have focused on European populations as well as relying on job title as a proxy or as a substitute for exposure rather than measuring the actual chemicals to see you know, what chemicals are, might be the issue or causing any problems that we find. In addition, data on occupational exposures to workers serving racially and ethnically diverse population is currently lacking. And why this is important, we've sort of heard about this a little bit. Um, so next slide. We know um, that products that are marketed for use among black women, including those of African-American, African and Afro-Caribbean descent, contain many uh, chemicals that are hormone disruptors, as well as lye, toxic solvents, and other adhesives. Next slide. This is uh, the same study that Dr. Dotson was talking about where they measured chemicals in different products marketed to women of color, particularly black women, and they found many hormone disrupting agents, including parabens and phthalates, 84% of the chemicals were not listed on product labels, and they also showed that hair relaxers marketed for children contain many regulated or restricted chemicals. Next slide. So as we've heard before, I believe um, Dr. Romero talked about this. We know that in general, using national biomonitoring data from the CDC, that women have higher levels in their bodies of chemicals that are commonly found in hair, skincare, and other personal care and beauty products compared to men. We also know that among women, women of color are also suffering a disproportionate burden of exposure to these chemicals. And we also know, as we've heard from other speakers, that women of color are using a wider variety of products that are marketed specifically for this population and with a greater frequency. Next slide. So this is important to me, it was important because, you know, given this information and knowledge that we knew, we know that we have an environmental health disparity going on in terms of exposure. And then I started thinking, well, are there any other, within these, are there any other vulnerable populations that we're forgetting about? And when you have, when you're talking about hairdressers of color, including black and Latina as well, you're talking about a population that, of women that is already more highly exposed compared to their white counterparts to these chemicals because they're using it for, on themselves, you know, for personal use. And they're also, you're adding on and increasing their, their exposure to these chemicals from their occupation, right? They're using these products every day, not only on, them, uh, on their clients, but also outside of the job. And the reality of it is, is that we don't know what the potential long-term health impacts of these exposures are in this population. So there's a critical need to examine the extent of these exposures, as well as their potential health impacts, in order to establish more protective measures, help determine and inform safer products, as well as inform uh, culturally relevant and appropriate interventions. And I want to highlight that because, you know, I believe it was LaDonna Williams who said, you know, we are not all the same, right? You can't, and this is an issue actually that I had when publishing one of the papers, we had pushback. One of the reviewers said something along the lines, well, white women are also using these products. And we're like, no, no, they're not. These, this is a completely different population. We're overlooking them. And so we kind of had to fight back on that because of what we wrote. Um, but really we don't know what the extent of exposures are. And it is very possible that an intervention 
could be very different for say a salon that's predominantly serving a black clientele compared to a salon that's going to be serving a predominantly Latina uh, population. Next slide. So that drove us to do a pilot study uh, to characterize indoor air quality concentrations of select uh, chemicals in indoor air, including volatile organic compounds or VOCs, as well as particulate matter and hair salons primarily serving African-American or black clientele, as well as a Latino clientele. And we also conducted some biomonitoring of study participants. And what I'll show you in the next few slides is some of our results for select indoor air pollutants, as well as our biomonitoring. Next slide. So the way that we designed our study, it was a pilot study, it was a small pilot study, we were limited by resources. And we recruited six hair salons, three were what we call Dominican salons because they were providing a specific blowout service, but really the predominantly, uh, the hairdressers are predominantly Latina. And then we also recruited three African-American or salons serving a predominantly black clientele from the Maryland and Washington DC metro area recruiting a total of about 23 hairdressers from these salons. And we also recruited 17 office workers of similar uh, race and ethnicity because we wanted to see if there were, you know, drastic differences. The study was conducted over essentially four days. During the first or baseline visit, that's when we went in and we determined where we would put our monitoring equipment to make sure it wasn't in the way of the workers. We also, conducted um, or administered a questionnaire to the salon owners in which we asked different things uh, related to like workplace practices. And we also conducted a walkthrough facility inspection in which we reported different things that could potentially impact exposures to the hairdressers. Then over the next three days, we took, um, we, we conducted some air monitoring and on days two or three, which tended to be busy days, we collected a urine sample at the end of the day and that's where we measured essentially the chemicals that we were interested in. And we also conducted a questionnaire on the hairdressers where we asked them not only about their general use of products and services that they provided, but also we, we also asked on the same day in which we obtained the urine sample, whether they use certain products or conducted certain services. Next slide. So for our study participants, again, we had 23 hairdressers and 17 office workers. It was roughly 50-50 split of Latina and Black and hairdressers, um, similar proportion of Latina and Black office workers. Our hairdressers tended to be lower income compared to office workers. Again, this was what we call a convenience sample, which is essentially we recruit whoever wants to be in the study who meets our eligibility criteria. Also, most in both groups were non-smokers. Hairdressers reported receiving more hair salon services on themselves in the last 12 months compared to office workers. And hairdressers are also slightly older, but still within the reproductive or childbearing age. And something that we found really interesting is that close to half, and we're talking just a small sample of 23 hairdressers, close to half of them reported working during pregnancy. And in fact, two of the participants were pregnant. One was due like in the next few days. Um, so this is you know, something not to be overlooked. Next slide, please. So I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Um, so it, it's not showing up, but essentially what we found, um, it was on my slides. This is, um, we, this is a result from benzene concentrations in air. And again, we sampled for benzene um, over those three days in the salons. And what we found was that the median concentration, the median stands for like the middle value when we're talking about a range of concentrations at each of the salons, we found that median values for benzene among the six salons sampled were anywhere between two to 30 times higher than federal uh, occupational uh, standards as well as governmental guidelines which is of concern because benzene is a recognized carcinogen and it's been associated with different adverse health effects, including effects on the bone marrow, decrease in red blood cells, anemia, and other, um, other health effects. Next slide, please. So in this slide, what we're seeing is, 
So on each of these uh, individual boxes, if you will, we, we see two boxes. We have pink and blue. The pink or the one on the, the boxes on the left represent hairdressers and the blue ones represent um, office workers in this case. And basically this tells us the, the range of concentrations that were observed in the urine of hairdressers and office workers for different volatile organic compounds. And what we found was that in general, uh, we measured a total, by the way, of 28 different volatile organic compounds in their urine, and we found that for a, a little bit more than half of them, we found that they were significantly higher than those observed among office workers, which is really telling considering we had a really small sample size. Next slide, please. So in here, what we did is we're comparing same um, chemicals in the urine, but this time we're comparing black hairdressers versus hairdressers working in the Dominican or, or Latino salons. And what we found was that for several volatile organic compounds, women working in bl or black hairdressers had much higher concentrations of these VOCs compared to Dominican, those working in Dominican salons. And we believe that that's because of the different services and products that are being provided. Now, I'm not, I'm not showing you a slide on this, but we also found differences for, for particular matter where for particulate matter, it was much higher among Dominican hairdressers compared to black hairdressers. And we believe that's also because of a lot of blow drying that takes place on Dominican salons compared to black salons. Next slide. So this is a comparison of the range of concentrations between hairdressers and women in the general US population using CDC data, where we're comparing women of the same age range. Um, and what we're finding is that hairdressers in our study had geometric mean concentrations that were much higher than those observed among women in the US. And also compared to a study from Boston, actually, from women seeking IVF treatment, we found that our median concentrations were up to 41 times higher than those reported in these other women. Next slide. We also found a similar um, findings when we compared hairdressers and office workers for select phthalate biomarker concentrations in which we observed much higher concentrations among hairdressers compared to office workers. Again, these were statistically significant findings. And again, this is very telling because our sample size was pretty small. Um, next slide. So in this graph, what we also did, remember I, I told you that we also conducted some surveys in which we asked about the different services and products uh, that were being used and provided in these salons by the hairdressers in, or because we wanted to determine if unique services or specific products they were using were linked with higher concentrations of different chemicals in their bodies. And what we found here on the left-hand side, you see the different services or products that were being provided that we asked about, just a few of them. And across on the top, you see the different volatile organic compounds. Wherever you see a plus, that means that it was a, if the hairdresser reported providing that service or using that product, we did see higher concentrations compared to those not using or reporting that product or service. And if it's a deep purple box, it means it was a significant, statistically significant finding. In other words, we were powered enough to find uh, statistically significant findings. And what we see here is that, for example, chemical relaxer use was associated with higher one bromopropane biomarkers in the urine of hairdressers. And one thing that I wanna point out that's unique is that we did also ask about natural hairstyles and we are finding that select natural hairstyles are still linked with higher exposures to some chemicals. Now, I think that, you know, there's this big push for natural hairstyles, but we also have to remember that just because it's a natural hairstyle, it does not mean that there is no product being used. Um, next slide. Similar findings were observed for methyl ethyl phthalate, which is a biomarker for diethyl phthalate, which is a chemical that's frequently found in many hair care products and has been linked to, to breast cancer risk in prior studies. And we found that those hairdressers that were providing these services that you see here, including texturizing, chemical straightening and relaxing, bleaching, permanent hair coloring, as well as Brazilian blowout and keratin treatments had higher concentrations than those hairdressers who did not provide these services. Um, for some of these, they even had double of the concentration in their urine compared to those hairdressers not conducting these services. Next slide. 
So I do want to point out some pilot study limitations. For one, it was a convenience sample of hairdressers. And we didn't, for example, recruit Caucasian hairdressers, although we did uh, compare our results to those in the general, general US population. In addition, we this was what you call a snapshot in time of what exposure looks like. It could be that exposures may vary by season. Um, we went in on days, remember I told you that we went in on three days to do our air monitoring and our biomonitoring, and we purposely selected two quote unquote busy days where we expected a high clientele volume, including like it was probably like a Friday or a Saturday. And then the other day we chose to be like a slow day, if you will, so that we could capture, you know, variability in exposures and sort of see the extent of exposures within a short time frame. And also we did use what we call real time monitoring equipment, which gives us um, for some of these, for example, for the air monitoring where it gives us real-time concentrations on a minute basis. And we originally sought out to have our study staff record what services and products were being used so that if we saw a spike in the instrument, we could kind of you know, correlate that spike to a given service or product. However, we were not able to do this because our staff was actually getting sick and could not document this. Next slide. So this is the first study. All of the biomonitoring uh, data has been published. It was published in the last month. Um, this is the first study to assess indoor air quality and select contaminants among salons primarily serving women of color. We did observe differences between hairdressers and office workers, as well as among hairdressers based on race and ethnicity of not only the hairdressers, but also the client, the predominant clientele being served. So our data suggests that larger, more in-depth studies are needed in order to properly characterize the extent of chemical exposures in salon settings, making sure to have a racially and ethnically diverse group of hairdressers, as there might be occupational health disparities within this workforce. Also, we need to assess the potential health effects of these exposures in order to also inform interventions to mitigate them, as well as their potential health risk. Again, what I was saying before that you know, the whole idea behind getting at what products and services might be associated as well as other selling characteristics that we did document, we're trying to find areas where we can intervene. You know, we're trying to identify modifiable factors that we can then inform interventions. And these may vary by salon uh, clientele that's being served. And lastly, I wanna end with seeing and highlighting the fact that this is a predominantly female workforce, again, low wage workforce, and many of these women are of childbearing age, which means that exposures among these women should not be overlooked for many reasons that we have heard our other speakers talk about, but also because exposures during the preconception as well as prenatal period could impact children's environmental health um, over their lifetime. Next slide. So I wanna quickly thank our funders, our student interns, collaborators, the CDC, our community partners, as well as the hair salon owners and hairdressers in our study. Next slide. So that's my information. Um, if anybody has any questions and you want to ask me later or ask me now, please, you know, feel please feel welcome to do so. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiro Sakala. The presentation was amazing and a wealth of information. Thank you. Uh, we do have one question that has been placed in our Q&A. It's from Paula Johnson, and she asked, what type of masks were used when associated with lower levels of chemicals? That's a great question, and I forgot to highlight on this slide. Um, we did ask, again, we asked about workplace behaviors and personal behaviors, um, and we also, you know, we also asked, because we know that personal care products can impact exposures to many of these chemicals, we also did ask about that, as well as asking about PPE or personal protective equipment that was used at work. We did ask about whether they wore masks when they performed chemically intensive services, which included the Brazilian blowout, hair coloring, et cetera. But that was just a yes, no question. And that is another limitation because we didn't ask about what type of mask was being used. That is an excellent question. And moving forward, that is something that we also wanna pursue, especially with COVID, we are gonna see people maybe potentially starting to wear more masks and this may actually help 
decrease some of these exposures? So that's a great question. Thank you. We have another question from Jennifer Saunders. She asked, similarly, did you ask about any other types of PPE, such as gloves? We did ask about gloves. Um, I believe that we did find, we didn't find what we call statistically significant findings with gloves. Again, this was a small study, but we did ask about gloves as well as masks. And one thing I wanted to also add is that we did return results to the hair salon owners and the hairdressers. Obviously we didn't share personal results from the hairdressers with the salon owners, but we did any kind of air monitoring that we did in the salons, we did um, return those back to the salon owners and using what was available to us on the literature, we did inform them, hey, these are the potential sources. These are some ways or some things that you could do to mitigate, to mitigate exposures, not only at the workplace, but also at home. Because again, I do feel that as researchers, it is, mm -hmm. we, we shouldn't just come in and use them and, and leave, especially when there is some information that we do know in some of these chemicals, right? So to me, I felt, as an, I felt it as an ethical obligation to do that. And we did do that. And I had, I did give them also the opportunity for me to come to them and walk them through the results and explain to them what it meant. Um, so we did do that as well. Thank you. We also have a participant here who has a raised hand that would like to share verbally, and that's from LaDonna Williams. Ms. Williams. Yes, good afternoon again. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. One was um, if there was any data or research done on non-hairdressers usage of these products. Um, also, if there's been data on vapor intrusion, I mentioned the indoor uh, pollution from these chemicals. So is there vapor intrusion data related to hair relaxers or sediment that may remain in the pipes that back up um, in, you know, in either the salons or homes that, that use these products? And then my last question is, you know, for us, messaging is very, very important. And it might not have been your slide, I, and I apologize, it's been kind of a long morning for me, um, but one of the slides um, mentioned when it was going down the list of, you know, the different ethnic groups, when it came to Black, we were listed under the category non-Hispanic Blacks. And so why is it that we continue to look through these lenses and studies through non-Hispanic or, you know, Hispanic why is there not an effort to, you know, still study the various groups, but definitely, you know, African-American needs to stand on its own. So why are we continually lumped in that category where it's either black and brown or Hispanic, non-Hispanic? Thank you. So I made some notes, so let me know if I didn't get to one of your questions or understood it. So one, the first question was, did we assess exposure to these chemicals among non-hairdressers? And so we did have office workers in our study, also women. Most of them were predominantly either they were Latina or black or self-identified self as black or Latina. Um, so we did measure chemicals in their urine as well to make our comparisons. We also compared our results to those among women in the general US population of of the same age range um, to, to see whether, you know, how the extent of the chemical exposures that we're observing in the small pilot study. Then the next question was on intrusion from, I guess, chemicals staying in the ventilation system. We didn't, we were very limited by resources. So we actually did a lot compared, you know, based on the funds that we had, this was a lot just to give you a ballpark idea, when we're measuring chemicals, say for example, in urine, one sample could easily cost between 150 to $300, depending on chemicals you want to measure. Um, so in our study, for example, we measured two different panels. So you're talking about like three to $400 per sample. Um, so these studies are not, they're not uh, cheap to conduct. They do take a lot of time. So. Unfortunately, we did not do that. We did ask about general ventilation questions. Um, 
there have been some studies outside the U.S. that also, for example, collected information on the outdoor concentrations of volatile organic compounds to kind of compare the outdoor concentrations to indoor concentrations. Um, but we didn't do that. Again, we were limited by resources. And I can tell you that most of these salons, the location in which they were at was very similar. What I mean by that is like a lot, a lot, all of them were pretty much in strip malls next to busy streets. Um, but we didn't get into like the nitty gritty of the ventilation and we, we are hoping to do that. Um, this was one of the limitations of our pilot study. And then the next question is, it was talking about race. Can you expand on that one again? I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Yeah, it, um, that one was just more specific to um, when we're looking on the list a lot of times we see um, when it says, you know, uh, African-American or black of black descent or whatever, it'll say non-Hispanic. It's like, why can we not be categorized or why is there not more effort to list us specific? We should be specifically listed as either African-American or black. Why is there constantly that messaging of Latino and black together, either through the term, you know, black and brown, which is a general term we're always using, but it still sends a message to us that we cannot focus on black specific issues without adding in some other populations issue. But a lot of the messaging that we see coming through always lists us either non-Hispanic slash black, as opposed to black or African-American. But um, I did want to ask when when I mentioned about the vapor intrusion, it was specific because we are doing like um, water testing. And you're absolutely right. It's very expensive to do that testing. We get that. Um, and we're testing just drinking water. But we realize that vapor intrusion and indoor pollution, you know, is is also a, a real issue. And especially in uh, households that use a lot of hair products and relaxers. And so. That was kind of more of the question I was asking, was there data specific to the, um, you know, hair relaxers, if it actually settles into the pipes and also creating uh, additional vapor intrusion to whatever else, you know, we're being exposed to. To my knowledge, I have not seen that done. And again, to, and also to my knowledge, this was, our study was a first published study in the U.S. to focus uh -huh. specifically among, again, women of color, where I focused on they were either African-American or I believe there was one that was from Haiti, but the rest were African-American and Latina hairdressers. So this has, to my not, this has not been done before and that's, that's why we did it. Um, like I said, as a woman of color myself, I was, I'm interested in, in exposures in these understudied populations that are being overlooked. Um, and just as a, a little bit of background, you know, a lot of these hairdressers as somebody, as I believe, um, Ms. Robinson um, was saying is that they're not really, you know, when you're given a salon license, there's not much of information regarding like occupational safety and health that's provided. Um, and this was also, I confirmed this from the hair salon owners that were in my study as well. For example, in the state of Maryland, they have, it's very, very vague. For example, they have a sanitation rule where they say, hey, if you are, um, conducting these specific services, you must be in a well-ventilated area. Well, what does well-ventilated mean, right? It, they, they're they not specific. You have to think also that each salon, the layout is gonna be different. We had one salon where it was, it like, was like, probably an office, office building and each office was a hair salon workstation. Whereas you also had the other layout, which is like more open concept. So, you know, the, the guidelines, that are, that are given to hairdressers, hair 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 they're very vague um, and they're not, not comprehensive. So that's something that we need to work on as well. So I'm hoping that this study and this other studies will be more about it as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiaros, um Alcala. We, I hate to stop the conversation. I know um, that it's it's very invigorating. There's a lot going back and forth here. There are two more presentations we do want to get to as well. We are going over. 
So we will have to conclude the questions at this time and move to our next two presentations. I do want to let everyone know just as amazing and informative as these past presentations have been, the next two will be as well. I hope you'll be able to stay on with us and we will go slightly over. Our next presentation is going to be by Dr. Alexandra White. Uh, she's a, a Stedman investigator and she is going to be presenting on the use of hair straighteners in relation to breast and ovarian cancer risk. And she is with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Dr. White. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation to come speak today. Um, I hear a little bit of echo, but maybe it's gone now. Um, so a little bit of background, I am an epidemiologist and most of my work focuses on environmental exposures for breast cancer, um, which is how I started um, focusing on, you know, being interested in hair products. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm gonna start by a little bit of background on breast and ovarian cancer. Um, breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed among women in the US and worldwide. Although ovarian cancer is less common, it is responsible for more deaths than any other gynecologic cancer. Um, both breast and ovarian cancer have a number of shared risk factors, um, particularly reproductive factors, um, which points to a suspected hormonal etiology for both of these cancers. Um, and that's why we think that exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals um, may play a role in the etiology of these um, two cancer types. Next slide, please. And so hair products are one potential um, source of carcinogens and endocrine disruptors, as we've heard today. Um, and this is particularly concerning because um, use of hair dye and other hair products is extremely common. Um, hair dye and hair perming products have been found to contain aromatic amines, as an example. Um, and this is an established carcinogen that induces mammary tumors in rodents. Um, and one study found that women who used hair dye were eight times more likely to have aromatic amine DNA addicts in their breast ductal epithelial cells. Um, and this study was important to me because it showed that you know, the hair products that we're using are entering our bloodstream, the compounds from them, and they are reaching the breast tissue. Um, today, we're all focused on um, exposure to chemical straighteners and relaxers. Um, we've heard some great talks explaining um, about the different chemicals in those products, including phthalates, parabens, and metals, um, as well as the formulations that um, contain formaldehyde. And also, I feel like I, this talk has been set up so well with all of these amazing presentations today, um, but these products are much more commonly used by Black women. Next slide, please. Um, so far, the epidemiologic research on hair products and cancer risk has been um, limited and has largely focused on exposure to hair dye, um, with few studies considering the relationship of other hair products, including straighteners and relaxers. Um, use of chemical straighteners and relaxers have um, been primarily um, looked at in relationship to breast cancer. Um, and this has been done in um, some great studies, um, including the Black Women's Health Study, which has published two papers on the topic. Um, overall, they found no strong association for relaxer use, except perhaps a higher risk for heavy use of lye-containing straighteners with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. The Women's Circle of Health Study also um, observed a higher but imprecise risk um, for ER negative breast cancer. And the Ghana Breast Health Study found a 58% higher risk of overall breast cancer for hair relaxer use. Um, but there have been no other epidemiologic studies of straighteners and relaxers in relation to other cancer types. Next slide, please. So the objective of some of our work has been to evaluate the association between the use of hair products and breast and ovarian cancer risk in a prospective cohort. Um, and we've considered a range of hair products in our work, um, but today I'll be showing our results um, specifically for relaxers, straighteners, or pressing products. Next slide, please. So this work is all um, nested within the sister study, which is a large prospective epidemiologic cohort study of over 50,000 women across the US. Um, so we recruited women to be in the study um, in the early 2000s, at which point um, in order to be eligible for the study, they had to be breast cancer free. Um, they could be between the ages of 35 and 74. Um, and importantly, they all have a sister who has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, so these women have an enhanced risk of developing both breast and ovarian cancer risk um, because of this um, family history. 
This cohort is an active follow-up, so our participants complete annual health updates as well as more detailed surveys. If women in the study are diagnosed with cancer, um, they self-report that, and then we ask for um, medical records and pathology reports um, to confirm their diagnosis and to get more information about their tumors. Next slide, please. So to give you an idea of what the sister study um, baseline characteristics are, so the average age was about 55 years when they enrolled in the study. Um, so they're about in their mid 60s now. 82% um, of the women are non-Hispanic white and 9% are African-American or black. About a third have a household income greater than $100,000 a year and about half have a bachelor's degree or higher. So this is a slightly higher socioeconomic status population um, but similar to other volunteer-based cohorts in the U.S. So right now we have on average about 10 years of follow-up since the women entered the study. Um, during this time, 4,000 women have been diagnosed with breast cancer and about 240 women have been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Next slide. Um, so all 50,000 women in our study um, completed a very extensive and structured personal care product questionnaire. Um, so we asked about a range of products um, in addition to hair products, also beauty products, um, skincare products. Um, but so the questions that were specifically focused on straighteners and relaxers um, are shown here. So we asked them about their use of these products between the ages of 10 to 13 and in the 12 months prior to their enrollment in the study. We also asked them about their non-professional application of these um, straightener products at both of these ages as well. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to start by showing um, the frequency of use that's reported um, stratified by um, race. So I think maybe the bottom of the slide is cut off on mine. So hopefully it, you guys can see it. Um, but the shaded bars um, with the lines are non-Hispanic white and the solid bars are African-American black. Um, so you can see frequency of use um, of these products um, for both age 10 to 13 and in the 12 months um, before study enrollment seem to follow a similar pattern, which is what we would expect. Um, use of these products is more frequent um, in the um, Black participants in the sister study, um, and interestingly is pretty similar um, between these two age ranges. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to show some results from a few different analyses that we've done um, using this data, um, looking at the frequency of use of these hair products in relation to both incident breast and ovarian cancer risk. Um, so we use a statistical approach called Cox Proportional Hazard Models to estimate um, hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals, which compares the risk of developing breast cancer or ovarian cancer um, if for using these products compared to not using these products. We also evaluated whether these associations varied based on cancer type. So for breast cancer, we um, often consider the estrogen receptor status of the tumor, as well as menopausal status at diagnosis. And for ovarian cancer, we looked at different um, tumor histologic types. For all of our analyses, we stratified by self-identified race ethnicity. Um, so we estimated associations for non-Hispanic white women and for African-American black women. Um, but we unfortunately do not have the sample size to consider other race and ethnic groups. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start by talking about the results for early life straightener use in relation to breast cancer risk. So as a reminder, this is self-reported use of these products between the ages of 10 to 13 years, and then um, in relation to adult breast cancer risk. So you can see that for overall breast cancer, um, frequent use of straighteners was not um, significantly associated with breast cancer risk. Um, but we do see the stronger association for premenopausal breast cancer, so breast cancer who, that's diagnosed prior to menopause. And this association was strongest for frequent use of these straighteners during early life. Um, but we saw no higher risk for postmenopausal breast cancer or um, for ER positive breast cancer. Um, and potentially we see the suggestive increase in risk for ER negative tumors. Next slide, please. So next um, we looked at adult use of these straighteners. So this was in the 12 months prior to enrolling in the study. Um, so the first part of the graph um, looks at personal use of these products. So we can see that um, frequent um, personal use of straighteners, which was defined as using at least every five to eight weeks was associated with about a 30% higher risk of breast cancer. And when we looked at application to others, we saw that ever applying um, straighteners to others in a non-professional setting was also associated with an elevated risk. Um, and we had very few women who reported um, frequently applying to others in a non-professional 
um, setting, which is why that confidence interval is so wide. Next slide, please. Um, so this is um, looking again at this adult use of straighteners on breast cancer risk, stratifying by race ethnicity. Um, so we can see similar patterns of association um, with elevated risks um, for frequent um, use of straighteners for both non-Hispanic white women and for black women. Next slide. And then finally, we considered adult use of these hair products in relation to ovarian cancer risk. Unfortunately, we just didn't have the sample size to look at the early life product use in relation to ovarian cancer. Um, but we see again here that women who reported frequent use of straighteners defined as more than four times per year had a higher, about a two times higher risk of ovarian cancer um, during adulthood. Um, and we see that this appears to be stronger for um, non-serous ovarian tumors. Next slide, please. So in summary, because I know I just covered a lot of results, um, for breast cancer, we, um, for adolescent use of straighteners, we saw about two times the risk for premenopausal cancer um, for frequent use. Um, and this finding is important because premenopausal breast cancer tends to have a worse prognosis um, and also potential side effects um, such as decreased fertility from cancer treatments. For adult use of straighteners, we also saw this 30% higher risk for overall breast cancer. Um, for both the adolescent and adult use of straighteners, these associations tended to be stronger for ER negative tumors. Um, and this is important because ER negative is more aggressive and tends to have a worse prognosis compared to ER positive. And black women are also more likely to be diagnosed with these ER negative tumors. Um, for ovarian cancer, we saw that adult use, frequent use of straighteners was associated about two times the risk of ovarian cancer. Overall, we saw that our estimates of association tended um, to not significantly vary by race. Um, it's important to note that because these straighteners are so much more commonly used by African-American and black women, these results are much more important for that population. Um, and so um, these findings are you know, um, really just more impactful and relevant for them because of how um, rare it is for um, and less frequently used it is in non-Hispanic white women. Next slide, please. Some considerations. So this study, um, the sister study is a prospective study design, meaning that we ask women about their hair product use um, years prior to their breast or ovarian cancer diagnosis, which limits the possibility of recall bias, um, but there's still the possibility of recall errors. We are asking women to think back to their early adolescence to report their frequency of use, um, but to try to minimize this error, we use broad classifications of um, exposure, so never, sometimes frequent. Um, we did, you know, despite having a population of 50,000 women, we just still have some limited statistical power um, to consider differences by race and ethnicity. So we asked women kind of, you know, broad questions about their use of straighteners and relaxers. So we have no information on their specific, you know, products or formulations that they use. And as we've heard um, many times today from the Helm study, we know that also um, that a lot of the um, exposures are likely not marked on labels anyways. And so it's hard for us to pinpoint, you know, what specific chemicals might be driving this increase in risk. And our straightener use question also included a reference to pressing products. So they asked about use of straighteners, relaxers, and um, or pressing products. Um, and so this would be a shorter term, less permanent method of straightening hair, um, which would require, you know, potentially other additional hair products, but really weren't the ones that we were interested in here. Um, and so that may result in our, res in our findings be an underestimate of um, the exposure. And finally, all women in our study do have a family history of breast cancer. Um, and this puts them at a higher risk of both breast and ovarian cancer risk. Um, and so this may make our results, you know, not generalizable to all women. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, in this large prospective study of women in the US, we observed a higher risk of both breast and ovarian cancer among women who reported frequent use of relaxers and straighteners or pressing products. Um, but future studies are needed in large diverse populations with a greater representation of racial ethnic minorities. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to thank my wonderful collaborators on all of this work, um, as well as the sister study participants and our funding sources. And I think the next slide has my email um, and I'd be happy to um, take any questions now or also via email later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. White. Again, a wealth of information and excellent, excellent presentation. 
Uh, for those of you that are joining us again, you do have the opportunity to participate. Um, you can raise your hand and or type your question in the Q&A. Uh, we do have one additional um, presentation as well. And for those of you who are on the phone, I don't wanna neglect you. Um, you can press star nine and we can see you in the queue as well. And we will unmute you by uh, first calling the last three digits of your number. Um, I don't currently see any questions for you, uh, Dr. White, if you have a moment uh, to stay on. Um, we have one more presentation and we may have questions from both uh, presentations immediately following that. So at this time, we are going to transition uh, to our final guest presentation. And that is the cost of beauty, attitudes, beliefs, and hair product toxicity. It is being presented by Dr. Dede Tete. She is a postdoctoral fellow with the City of Hope. We also have joining her Phyllis Clark. And Ms. Clark is the founder and CEO of Healthy Heritage Movement. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tete. And if you're speaking, Dr. Tay-Tay, please know um, you need to unmute. We are unable to hear you at this time. And Hi, Michelle, thank you. Well, I'm going to have Phyllis go ahead and get us started. Oh, yes. great. I'm sorry. I just unmuted and, and put the video on, but I don't see myself. I don't know if you could see me, but I just want to congratulate the team. What an amazing workshop one. Good afternoon. I was already introduced. But I'm Phyllis Clark, uh, founder and CEO of the Healthy Heritage Movement. And I wanna introduce you to our project, The Cost of Beauty, Attitudes, Belief, and Hair Products Toxicity. The Cost of Beauty project was partnered by several different organizations. The community partners were Healthy Heritage, and the other was Southern California Witness Project. And our research partner was the Loma Linda University. And we were kindly funded by the California Breast Cancer Research Project. This was a three-year project. And we had three aims to answer our question. Is the cost of beauty putting black women at risk for breast cancer. And in order to find the answer to this question, we wanted to first establish, establish relationships with the community, with care care providers and others that um, had to do with uh, the hair industry, such as manufacturers, retailers and so forth. And we did this by pulling together qualitative methods. We used the data, the data that we found to create literature and to develop our pilot survey instrument that we wanted to disseminate into the industry or into the community to um, basically get their feedback on our project. And our third aim was to design a, a systematic way to disseminate the information that we found the findings back to the community. So some of the partners that we pulled together to build relationships, we had a community advisory board of five people that are individuals or organizations that included hair salons as well as community members. And we, we created a mixed method survey tool and we created samples. Our survey tools was disseminated throughout African-American women organizations such as um, for, um, I'm sorry, I just lost the term. Churches, hair salons, community meetings, and so forth. We also 
worked with local artists because that is a, a really important niche in the African American community, collecting, uh, con connecting with the uh, artistic and creative community as well. So our um, data collection was from 13, 2013 to 2016. Next slide, please. This is our team. We had community, as I mentioned earlier, Healthy Heritage, Quinn Community Outreach. We had our wonderful program coordinators. Um, we had two, Rebecca and Didi. We had our evaluator, Paris Atkins, and we had two other researchers, Sabine and Bing. And together we pulled uh, together a, a great uh, program. I'd like to introduce you to our lead program coordinator on this project, who's going to introduce you to the findings of this research. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And again, I just wanna echo some of the sentiments that that's have already been shared. This has been an amazing program. So I will go ahead and go through art slides, just sharing a little bit of the work um, that our community pulled together as it relates to the discussion on this topic. Uh, so as it relates to our participants, it most primarily identified as African-American men and women. So we included partners, the, the partners of the women um, as a part of our research as well. They were primarily college degree educated or higher, mm -hmm. primarily between the ages of 50 and 59 years, of, um, years old, 60 or higher for women, um, for men for women and then 50 and through 59 years of age for the men in our sample. And if you take a look at the household income, it was primarily ranging between 25 to 50,000 for both groups. So this is what's more relevant to this conversation is 91% of the women from our sample received a perm or relaxer in their lifetime. And the age at first perm was 17, primarily for our group. However, we did also have in women within our sample report a first perm usage um, as early as five years old. So I I know there were some discussions about that earlier in the day. So when it comes to the discussion about attitudes and beliefs concerning toxic products, um, we of course have spoken about this topic in length as it relates to identity, racism, the politics of black hair in the United States. And so I will just share a few quotes from our participants speaking directly to that context. Um, as we've shared earlier during the day, hair is everything. So hair is critically important to the black community, specifically black women as it relates to our sample and the black men as well um, that, that are their partners. And really our community members reaffirm this connection between hair and identity and their health. Um, and as we've spoken about also in length throughout the day, just this is just more of a reminder about the politics of hair in our society that upholds a Eurocentric ideal of beauty um, as a gold standard. And many um, from this conversation that we've had all day have recognized that. So I wanted to leave you all with this quote from one of our male participants, um, which is we haven't really had conversations about what are the men's perspectives. And I'm hoping I'll share a little bit of that context during this presentation. But this is what we've all been saying. So if the majority of commercials and ads that we saw look like Lupita from 12 Years a Slave, everything will be flipped on its head. Even white women will be trying to get their hair nappy. You'll have hair products that turn hair nappy. So again, relating to the Eurocentric ideals that are upheld by our society uh, with undercurrents of racism and discrimination that many Black women um, and others have to deal with and contend with and continues to deal with and contend with. So here are some of the dominant themes from our qualitative research. 
Uh, from the Black woman's perspective of the role of hair is synonymous with identity. And while Black women understood and currently understand the relevance of the discussion on the potential role of hair products and breast cancer, most resolve that everything causes cancer. So why change the products that they work so hard and so well to maintain their current hair in whatever state is being maintained. For the black men in their lives, they also had a lot to say about the connection of black women to their hair. So they reaffirm that connection and that topic for our population. Um, but many also lack the knowledge of the connection to harmful chemicals like EDCs that we talked about in length during the day, um, and hair products and breast cancer is. But they also acknowledge the importance of educating our community about these potential risk factors. And really both groups as a part of our sample agree that community forums, social media, and churches were really the ideal spaces to bring this type of information to our community to discuss this, these important topics, but then also to provide ways of intervening for our community. As Ms. Clark mentioned, um, Dr. Parrish Jackson was one of the consultants on the project. And we also examined 54 products from six beauty salons in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Um, she examined the ingredients list using the Environmental Working Group Skin Deep database. And of the 54 products that, she, uh, that we were able to examine, 26 were available in the Skin Deep database which consisted primarily of shampoos, conditioners, and hair dyes. Um, and there were very minimal information found on hair relaxers. And we found out of this 54, um, 54 products that were examined, 14 ingredients were consistently from this list of chemicals that were assessed, were associated, of course, with various health concerns, including cancer and other endocrine disruption, which we've spoken about in length as well. So the, on the slide are a number of different chemicals that came up during our examination utilizing the Skin Deep database. And we've so, spoken about a number of these chemicals already. So here are some examples of the relaxer brands from the salons in Riverside and San Bernardino counties from the work that Dr. Jackson um, completed. And several of the relaxer products um, did not have product ingredients information listed in the Skin, skin Deep da database. And so as it relates to one of the particular products that we do have information for African Pride, I'll just share a little bit of that information here on the slide. Um, for the sake of time, again, a lot of these chemicals have shown up throughout the discussion that we've had this morning and also this afternoon. Purple paraben fragrances, which many of us have, uh, have already shared, uh, shows up in a lot of the products that we are looking at, especially within the African-American context. However, many of the in chemical ingredients in the word fragrance is often not listed on these product labels. So one of the important aspects of this project was engaging the community in our data collection and report out efforts, like we mentioned. And so while the community members are concerned about the ingredients in all personal care products, including hair relaxers, the advocacy efforts from CBOs that you've heard from, um, for example, Healthy Heritage Movement, Black Women for Wellness, EWG, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, and the tons of researchers that you've heard from today, including the work that DTS, um, DTSC is working on, and the community being involved as, as a part of this project, it, process is very critical. Um, and I really do applaud your efforts for that. So I want to leave you all with this quote as we bring it back to why we're all here today and it's for our communities to be well and to live their lives in the best way possible without the exposures to these harmful chemicals in our everyday products. So this is just a note that I just wanna leave with all of you as it relates to community attitudes, beliefs um, from the folks that we've spoken to. And at the end of the day, what needs to happen is these products do not need to be on our shelves because there's a little note on every package of cigarettes, harmful to your health, may cause cancer. My mom and dad smoked their whole lives. They never got cancer. I try to believe that even if that the studies show black hair products cause cancer, you're going to get those men and women that say, well, not everyone is going to get it. 
So I'll leave that with all of us this afternoon as we talk about all the great work that everyone is doing. The reality is the critically important aspect of advocacy needs to continue because I shouldn't have to worry as a consumer to go into a store having to pull out the EWG Healthy Living app to ensure that the products that I'm using are not exposing me to possible um, concern, health concerns as breast cancer or even ovarian cancer as we've discussed today. So I will leave us with that note and take any questions that anyone would have. So for the sake of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Tay-Tay. Also, Ms. Clark uh, and Dr. White. Uh, many thanks to all of you. And at this time, we will take any clarifying questions you may have. Again, uh, we are interested in your participation and feedback. Also, if you have any comments at this time with any of the presentations that you've heard today, you can raise your hand if you have joined us online uh, to be recognized, or you can type in the Q&A. If you're on the phone, please uh, hit star nine and you will also be added to the queue. And at this time, uh, we don't see any questions, but we do want to share a little bit more information about getting feedback from you. Uh, as we indicated, one of our goals for today is to hear from you. We are currently in a public comment period. All of that subsequent information, our background document is available on our website. Our comment period will extend. It started on May 24th and it will continue until July 9th. Um, you can provide comments at CalSafer. For those of you who have joined us online, that information is available in the chat. The link is pretty long, but if you are joining us by phone, if you go to www.calsafer.dtsc.ca.gov, you can scroll down and look at comment periods that are open and you will see one for hair straighteners and that is this comment period. So you can provide written comments as well. Next slide, please. Oh, and I see here as I go to this next slide, uh, we do have a question that has been typed in our Q&A. Uh, one from Ephraim, and it indicates, what do you think the source of the 13 uh, butin metabolites are in the hairdressers? And if any of our presenters can address that particular item, and feel free, you can raise your hand as well if you'd like to speak to that. It's actually addressed to uh, Dr. Kiros Alcala. So if Dr. Alcala is still with us. Hi, right, sorry, can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, what do you think the source of the 13 butadine metabolites are in the hairdressers? I believe I'm saying that correctly. So I, I have to, three butadiene. Thank you. I'd have to look back. Like I don't know the top of my head. Um, let's see. We are. I can't. You know, one thing I wanted to highlight, and I actually spoke to this to another panelist as well. Um, we also aimed to record, like, get an inventory of the products that were being used and the ingredients, but this we found out it was very overwhelming. It got very overwhelming very quickly because in some cases, you know, these women rent their workstations. So the chemicals that are being, or products that are being used by one hairstylist are not gonna be the same ones being used by another one. And just to give you a rough idea, like we had one hairdresser with a shelf piled up with over a hundred different products. So it was not a good use of our time. So that's why we just relied on questionnaire data, which is not, uh, the best, but but at this point, that's, that's what we used. Um, I'm looking at my slide here, sorry, I have two screens, and looking at the one through rutadiene, I can't ascertain for sure which product it was, but we did find um, 
that many services were associated with increased levels of this chemical, um, including afros. So it could be something that's particularly being used uh, for these hair services. We're not, the bot bottom line is we're not sure. And the idea is to expand the study um, to take a better look at this as well. Thank you, Dr. Alcala, and thank you, Ephraim, for the question. Um, we are going to continue. If I see another question, I will um, recognize you at that time. But if we could now also go to the next slide. So the themes um, for questions to our stakeholders, when you review our background document, um, there are four of them. They include theme number one, chemicals and hair straightening products. Number two, exposure to chemicals from hair straightening products. Theme number three, toxicity of chemicals and hair straightening products. And theme number four, market presence. Um, so those are some of the questions, and there are more that are present in our background document. And again, we do wanna hear from you. Next slide, please. So to contact us, this is our contact slide. And again, these slides will be made available on our website. Uh, you can join our e-list. Uh, so when you do go on site, please do so. It's simply bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash SCP updates. Very easy to remember, uh, bit.ly uh, slash SCP updates. And that is to get on our general email list. All questions again to our uh, safer consumer products at dtsc.ca.gov. If you are part of a media outlet or a media entity and you are joining us today, uh, we do have a public information officer that works directly with Safer Consumer Products. Uh, his name is Sanford Nax. You can reach him as well at sanford.nax at dtsc.gov. And if you have any questions, please reach out to our project manager, Christine Papagni at dtsc.ca.gov. Again, that's christine.papagni at dtsc.ca.gov. And if you have any meeting requests, uh, there are a number of stakeholders who like to follow up with some of the team members at DTSC. You can contact Heather Kessler here at DTSC and her email is heather.kessler at dtsc.ca, excuse me, .gov. Um, we also are going to encourage you to join us for our segment two of tomorrow. We are going to have a series of panel discussions that will go from nine to one o'clock. These discussions are going to include a number of amazing doctors with their research. So you can hear from them directly in a Q&A moderated session. Uh, Dr. Adana uh, Yanos will be joining us from Rutgers School of Public Health. Also, Dr. Astrid Williams, she is an environmental justice manager with Black Women for Wellness. Dr. David Andrews, a senior scientist with Environmental Working Group. Dr. Robin Dodson will be back. Um, and she, again, is from Silent Spring Institute. She's an environmental exposure scientist. And Paula Johnson, Dr. Johnson is a chief with the California Safe Cosmetics Program with California's Department of Public Health. You are not going to wanna to miss that. And before we close today, I would like to turn you over and introduce to you to DTSC's Deputy Director of the Safer Consumer Products Program who will give us closing remarks. And that is call, excuse me, Carl Palmer. Uh, so I would like to introduce you to Carl Palmer and Carl, uh, if you are on the line, I'd like to take this and uh, take the meeting and send it over to you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I'll be real brief. I know we're a little over. Um, I just wanted to share um, a few things about gratitude today. Uh, on behalf of Director Williams and myself and our, our entire DTSC team, um, I just want to thank our amazing panelists today for sharing their work and their wisdom with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and we look forward to working with you in the future. I wanna thank everyone for coming tomorrow uh, to further the discussion on these important issues. 
to, to engage with these panels and hear from some, some more remarkable people about their perspectives uh, and how we all have things to learn and things we can do. And then I'm going to express gratitude for the future because I want everyone to, uh, as Michelle said, give us your input, however you want to do it, uh, live in person, written comments, um, reach out to us. We need your help to get information to make the best decisions possible because we want to take action to make uh, these products safer and effective for anyone who wants to use them. So with that, um, again, thank you all so much. I'll look forward to seeing you all tomorrow, hopefully, uh, and we'll be uh, working as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. This now concludes our workshop.